Hi everyone, welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here and we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the Geologist. It's non-chess team. So I see some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand and we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you guys about the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind the scenes insights. <laughs> See you then. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the Swedish nature. I don't really know what my expectations were when I grew up. I just wanted to make games. I didn't really consider where that would take me. Today, I am the chief creative officer here at Mojang in Stockholm. We have more than 120 million monthly active users and more than 200 million sold copies of Minecraft. I often get a question on why is Minecraft so successful? I believe it's the way you interact with the world. It's very simple and uh, you have a big impact on just small actions. You quickly realize that you can build anything, so it gives you a very sense of uh, empowerment. <laughs> I came to Mojang because I've always been making games my entire life. Marcus Passion, he created Minecraft and his idea was to create more games with the support of the success of Minecraft. I got asked if I knew someone that could help them develop a new game. I said, well, I volunteer myself. For the first year, it was just me and Marcus working on Minecraft. It was really in the spirit, as we say in the, in the industry, like we were just doing things for fun. Sometimes we could have an idea on, on the Monday that was released on the Friday. So it was very high tempo <laughs> and uh, a lot of fun. When I started, the game had already sold 700,000 copies, uh, which was amazing and more or less unheard of in the, like, in the game scene. We believed that we had peaked but we quickly realized that Minecraft is here to stay. So that meant that I would take over the lead development of the creative vision for Minecraft. I think the most fun part about making games is the early phase where everything is possible. And it's both about creating a world, but also creating the rule sets of this world. 
when I look around, I always look at things and think about them in terms of game development. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a, it's a blessing or a curse. For instance, when we were on a holiday in Singapore, and they have these amazing plants that grow on the trees, like flowers. And I was thinking, oh, that we could use that. <laughs> like, Sweden might be a good place uh, to be a nerd. <laughs> Well, we have these really long, dark winters, uh, so it's not strange if anyone just stays indoors a whole weekend and working on something on their computers. That's potentially one of the reasons why we have so many good music artists uh, and also game developers, and we're, we have the time to really geek out on specific topics. Så vi har ju precis snapshotat lite olika features till Caves och Crips, till exempel koppar. Och vi har fått in lite olika feedback, så jag tänkte kolla lite med dig vad du tänker. Today I'm more guiding and directing ideas. And uh, Agnes Larsson is now leading the design team for Minecraft. We know that kids play a lot of Minecraft. So when we add new features, we try to consider if we can make this feature in a way that teaches them something. One of the reasons why we added bees was to put attention to that bees are very important for pollination but also for the way we produce food. And also Minecraft is a fancy world and not everything works as it does in real life obviously. <laughs> When I play Minecraft with my son, I build things and my son, he wants to go on an adventure. <laughs> so he just says, come on dad, come on dad, we need to go. And I'll say, okay, I'll follow you. When we're out exploring, I'm more like, oh, can we go back now? <laughs> can, we, can we continue building on, on the castle instead? <laughs> and he's like, no, no dad. <laughs> I'm always thinking about what I'm working on next. <laughs> You never really sit down and say, oh, this is it. It never really ends. <laughs> you just follow your drive. Hi, and welcome to the last game of this uh, special challenge match between David Howell and uh, Nils Grandelius. They're playing in the heart of London uh, at the Swedish Embassy. And uh, before this very last game, uh, David is leading the match 5-4 uh, to four, uh, and has the advantage of playing with the white pieces today. Uh, and I'm joined by Norwegian international master uh, Tor Fredrik Kossen. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. So, uh, Tor, uh, I mean... Thinking about the match uh, situation, uh, one game to go, mm -hmm. and David is playing with the white pieces. How, how do you think that will affect uh, Nils's opening choice in this last game? Yeah, so, yeah, as you said, uh, David is leading, so I think that will affect Nils in a way that uh, he will try to aim at something a bit more sharper than what he has maybe has gotten, uh, as it's not pleasant to lose the match. It's the last game, so I think he's, he's going to try to uh, at least play something playable, like uh, something which gives some counter chances for uh, Black. Uh, though it's uh, easier said than done, as David has played D4 and C4 here. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, Nils is obviously, I mean, maybe one of the, the very best uh, prepared players, I mean, in yes. the world and has been working with Magnus Carlsen in the past. Um, do you think he even will consider uh, getting a position that objectively is is better for White, but will actually give him some some dynamic chances in the game? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this is actually very in interesting. So here he has played the E6. So usually Nils plays the Grunfeld defense as uh, as far as I know. Uh, but I think that in inside the Grunfeld. White has many ways to play a sort of a risk-free position. Perhaps not with an edge, but it's very hard for, for Black to uh, get some real winning chances. So that is why I think he, he here has prepared to play E6 and want something playable in, inside there. Um, I, I think not necessarily he's going to choose something which gives White an edge, like ob objective speaking, but maybe something which is not as solid, maybe, as, as what he would usually do in a normal game. I think 
he's he's maybe going to play something a bit more um, fighting, but I'm not sure what. Uh, and yeah, they will be exciting then, to see. And uh, and I guess if he manages to to get David a bit uh, co- uh, catch him a bit off guard, uh, maybe he will will get some chances with with the black pieces. But not sure. But having maybe. said that, I mean in in this match, White has been doing really really well. Um, David has won two games. Uh, Nils has won one game, and um, those wins have come with the white pieces. So, um, statistically speaking, uh, it looks difficult for Nils, but uh, and I mean anything can still happen. And uh, yeah, I think yeah. this resembles uh, what we saw uh, in some of the other white games David has played earlier in this match. Um, in this position, I think he played e3 in his last uh, white game. Mm-hmm. And he has also played Queen uh, Queen B3, I believe. Queen B3, ah, okay, that's a sideline. Uh, queen Queen to B3 is not so often played. Uh, and I I think Black then goes C5 after Queen to B3. Maybe okay, it's several moves. But I I think like the fate of this game is, is a bit also in David's hands, as if you with White like wishes to get very solid. Is not so much that you can do with the. Uh, um, black, but okay. I guess we will see if David plays e e three. I think it's pot- potential for a bit more fighting game. Uh, mm-hmm. But he plays queen to c two, which has a reputation of being very very solid. Uh, and um, not sure uh, what what Nils is going to play here. Uh, I'm sure Nils is not too happy seeing queen to c two, unless he has something very nicely prepared here. So, so you would say this is the most solid option for white? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Queen to C2 is very solid. Um, and, um, I mean, I have to ask because um, we've been talking how Nils should approach this, this last game uh, with the black pieces. Yeah. But psychologically, it's also tough for David because, I mean, he will be happy with the draw. He's winning the match, you know, he's... Uh, uh, secured the win in the match and, and gaining some rating points uh, yes. and so on. But but to try and play for a draw, even with the white pieces, might backfire. And I think we've seen yes. so, so many times that uh, that might happen. So so what yeah, 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 it's very common. It's like uh, when you're playing for a norm and you only need a draw in the last round. Like if you're leading some tournament, you you, you sort of go a bit more passive. Uh, like I fall in into this trap myself also several times. And uh, okay, especially for my playing style, it really doesn't suit me playing solidly. So or not so solidly. Yeah, so. Uh, so yeah, it's like not easy for David also, uh, and I think the best thing to do is just to try to approach it as a normal game, but to try to keep the uh, what's what's happening on the board but under their control, um, so something safe. But um, yeah, so I I'm not sure what what Neil series is going to to play. Uh, I I think move D5 has gotten some um, like it's sort of trendy nowadays yeah and there there he goes with with the d5 if uh, nils instead of d5 would have uh, played short castles there was a pos- possibility that david would play the e4 line uh, and here uh, it's okay you you can play d d6 and this is something which nils maybe could have considered doing like uh, like it's not so bad but objectively speaking not 100 sound it gives playable positions but the objectively best move is d5 and here is a lot of uh, uh, lines which usually white is not risking so much. So, so that's why I I think that David here chooses uh, Nils here rather uh, chooses to move d5. And uh, if uh, white wants a bit more fighting game, he can take on d5, which is what usually he does and play like gets uh, quite sharp action. Actually, it's very exciting positions. But to move a a3 is probably the most solid you you can do there also. And um, so, uh, so the thing is, um, if uh, here you castles and say white now plays a a three, that's the idea behind queen to c two. Is that after bishop takes c three, you can take back with the queen. Here, the arguably best move for black is is to play d five, uh, but this leads to very very solid positions uh, for for white. I think it goes something like bishop to g five and. Okay, black is fine, but it's very few winning chances. Uh, but here, after move d5, uh, I think what David is trying to achieve is to transpose into those lines here by playing the move a 
HV here, and it's uh, quite likely to to transpose uh, into familiar lines here. Uh, but okay, I I think Black has ways to sort of deviate also with playable po position. So let's I'm I'm interested in what Nils is going to do here. And I mean, at some point, David also knows that Nils um, has to achieve something in this game, you know, with the with the black pieces. So, so maybe it's it's sensible for him to have a solid approach, uh, even though he's not necessarily thinking about uh, drawing quickly in any way, but just um, basically telling Nils, okay, I'm I'm happy with the draw. I will just play solid, and then it's up to you to create something and. And that might also backfire for Nils again, you know, if he's trying too hard. Yes. Um, and some positions are, you know, it's it's quite they are quite equal, or uh, it's difficult to kind of come up with with some um, dynamic play. Yes. And uh, maybe this is also one uh, one way for David to to approach this uh, this final game. Yeah. Yes. So like the the dynamic thing in this position is is that after a hv bishop takes c3 queen takes c3 uh, white has the bishop pair uh, but black has the better development so his piece is better developed uh, that is why this position is like uh, approximately equal since it's the question is the development more Im important or the bishop pair that is why often the theory makes black go very like aggressively to compensate for for the fact that white has the bishop pair but but in doing this often the game gets quite Simplified. That is why it's a bit hard for Nils to to sort of just ju just play slowly and, and to take it as a game, since often then White is is just slightly better with the bishop pair and so on. Um, so that is why it's a bit hard to for for Nils also in these kind of situations to sort of find. But um, yeah, no. But I think it's a smart uh, approach by David. Also, I I think it's quite sensible what he's doing, and I'm sure he has some ideas here, like. Probably also he's he's probably not looking to just force a draw. Also, I think uh, you can also get playable positions here. I think uh, Kasparov also played this uh, when he returned back to chess in St. Louis in 2017. Mm. He had some ideas here with with like H4 at, at some point in positions like this. I'm not sure when exactly, but um, and um, so it's uh, interesting. Young, I'm I mean if. David plays it in a manner that he wants to play for the ad advantage, then, then we really can get the next exciting games. So I uh, think the ball is a bit in David's hand also. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and actually, a funny story. Uh, some years ago, David was playing um, some, some training games with Kasparov in, in his summer house in, in Croatia. Oh, wow. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that must have been uh, quite the experience. But I think, I mean, uh, there were only training games. I believe they played both uh, Rapid and Blitz. But, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, Ma David managed to beat him a few times at least. And obviously, Kasparov had been retired for many years. So so he wasn't at his best. But, uh, yeah, that must have, as a chess player, a chess fan, that must have been uh, a great experience for him. No, it's a dream, yeah, to play. Yeah. Such a legend. So, yeah. One of the all-time all greats of sure. uh, chess. And, uh not necessarily saying that uh, David got some ideas, and I mean this is I don't know seven eight years ago now already. So they those ideas uh, are probably not as good uh, today as they were uh, back then. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's very in interesting. This also like the I ideas that you analyzed like many years ago. Like I heard from someone saying that after this new engines are arrived this lila and uh, like this kind of engines you sort of had to check all of your files again to see yeah. if what you said made any, <laughs> any sense at, at all <laughs> also um, that must be a bit frustrating because i imagine uh, many chess players have spent so many hours you know uh, gathering yeah. material preparing different lines openings and then you suddenly realize okay uh, this is actually not working and you have to <laughs> You have to kind of start over. Uh, that's a bit, a bit frustrating. But so, yeah, sure, sure. No, it was a big change that was coming up, and also like we saw in 2019 when, uh, okay, I think Magnus was one of the first guys like on top level that was really much using this Lila zero mm -hmm. and so on, and and he was always getting fresh new ideas. And yeah, this summer of 2019, yeah, was when when he his rating was going really much up. So I think it gave him a big. Uh, 
advantage there also. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, speaking of 2019, um, I think it was like the combination of, um, of ideas from Alpha Zero, uh, Lila, uh, but he also had so many ideas, you know, for the World Championship match in London 2018. Yeah. Which he, which he had the chance to use for 2019 also. So I think, I mean, both him and Caruana actually had a great 2019. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. Caruana was also in a really good form. Uh, like, for a long time, he won this Tata Steel tournament in 2020. Seemed like the big favorite going into the candidates and so on. So, you know, okay, it makes 100% sense that after World Championship match, you have been preparing for so long time. Of course, you have plenty of ideas. And, uh, and that's why I'm also a bit uh, excited to see Jan um, Nepomniachtchi, uh, how he will play this year. You know, he, he's, he, he started off uh, this uh, Champions Chess Tour season um, crushing in the preliminaries, and then he finally lost in the finals against Magnus. But um, yeah, he showed some great chess, and I'm sure he, he will have a good year uh, in, in 2022. Yeah, no, uh, like I... Like in this match between Magnus and Nepo, it was always this anti-marshals that, that they were getting. Nepo was, was getting slightly better po positions, but sure, he has analyzed those, those positions very much. And in the World Rapid, and, and this, I think it was in the Rapid, Nepo was playing uh, against Duda, and he got the same position. And like he was blitzing the whole game. It's, yeah. it, it, it seemed like he, he just knew everything, and he, he won in really nice fashion. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. was it uh, in the was it blitz or rapid? He took the silver medal in. That was rapid, I I yeah. think. Rapid, rapid, yeah. So yeah, uh, and I mean such a strong field in those uh, championships, rapid and blitz, and uh, <laughs> but, yeah, all, yeah, all the best players in the world, in addition to all these young talents, you know, uh, with rating over twenty six fifty, uh, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen year olds. So yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's quite uh, quite the achievement to to come top three, let's say, in in those uh, championships. Yeah, like it's like also for Magnus. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure, he has goal of winning it every time, but for him, even for him, it's not obvious that he's going to achieve it. Like it's such a hard feel. And okay, I'm not saying that luck is a big part, but to some extent, you also have to be lucky at some critical moments to yeah. get there. Absolutely. So. Um, and um, I do have to remind everyone uh, of this uh, fundraiser we're doing, a uh, joint effort between Chess24 and the Norwegian Refugee Council. We have had some technical uh, difficulties uh, last couple of days, but this is the final day and everything should be working now. So um, uh, as you can see on the broadcast, we have a QR code. Um, just tap your phone. And uh, it should be quite uh, simple and easy uh, to to donate. And uh, we, we can also post the, the link to the donation site in, in uh, chat. So if you have the chance to um, to uh, contribute uh, just a little bit, that would be great. And hopefully we can uh, at least reach uh, $10,000. We're currently at $9,779. So if we manage that, that would be fantastic. And uh, I'm sure we will get some some other significant contributions uh, during the last day. So uh, everything helps. And we are also following the, the chat. So uh, we will pay uh, attention to that today. So uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, comments about the match, um, so uh, join the conversation. Mm. And, uh, as Brian has said, hi and good evening. So welcome, Brian. So you are probably sitting in a different part of the world if it's already evening. Uh, for me, here in London, it's uh, still early afternoon. And uh, same for you, you're sitting in uh, Norway, right? Yeah, in Oslo. Uh, yeah, he, here is 15, 18, yeah, so. Yeah. But it's yeah. also really nice, this, yeah, that uh, like people from all over the world can be watching the stream. Yeah. Uh, like different hours of the time also. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, uh, Robert Levy says greetings from Mexico. That's great. So uh, okay. yeah, <laughs> people are following from all over the world. And uh, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised now to it because uh, suddenly David is uh, spending, I mean, at least a few minutes uh, on his next move. And, and I guess B6 is not a 
rare move to play in this position or yes. is it so as as far as i know b6 is one of the main moves yep uh or i'm not sure if specifically b6 is one of them it's like uh here the main move for for right as far as i know is is to have a bishop to g5 put a pin on 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 his queen uh and like the bishop pair is quite in, like a factor here so usually here uh, black goes d takes c4 and after queen takes c4 black now goes bishop to a6 and tries to follow up with a very quick c c5 just making use of the fact that he has better development uh, and trying to like get e enough di dynamic play for approximate equality for this but i think like here after b6 I think D takes C4 is is the main move. So perhaps David is a bit like slightly confused by the move order. For sure, he knows that he can't transpose into well from parts with Bishop to G5. But maybe he's thinking maybe I can play some extra option here uh, to to get a playable position. Maybe I'm I'm not sure. I think it makes sense for him. Like if he's not sure what he's going to uh, to to spend some time as uh, what he's now choosing is going to the Determine much as to how the game is going to go. Um, so, but I think he's ultimately going to play bishop to g5. That's my prediction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and after bishop to g5, maybe Nils even is just going to play something like bishop to b7, just saying, okay, sure, d, d takes c4 is probably um, the better move, theoretically and probably objectively also, but uh, bishop to b7 could be these sort of moves that it's not 100% directly correct, but certainly completely playable. And um, you can see uh, like it get into very playable fight here. So uh, it's in interesting. It's, um... Absolutely. And, and, and what other options uh, do you see for David if he's not playing uh, Bishop G5? Yeah, so it's uh, one option of just, just playing the move E3 here, maybe. It's one option to, to just and then develop your Bishop out and trying to go short castles. Uh, Maybe also a, a potential move could here be to go c takes d5. I'm not sure. Uh, and saying that maybe after e takes d5, like we, we could get the hang, hanging pawn structure. This this could be good, quite nice for white bishop to g5. Uh, but maybe here after c takes d5, uh, black has a very nice response in knight to e4. Mm. Uh, I I think I saw this back in the day actually when I was when I was quite young actually. I think also. Uh, Kramnik game, it was something like queen to c2, e takes d, d, d5, and on e, e3 there was bishop to f5. I think Kramnik once had, had a game here with the black pieces. Mm. I think I saw it once. So, this um, is a very interesting, interesting idea. Uh, yeah. But like you can see that this can lead to quite double edged play. Uh, but okay, I, I would be surprised if David at the same time haven't been looking at this. Like it's uh, quite common way of playing so you should have something here with the white pieces also but i think he is mainly just choosing lines here uh, it's yeah. for sure not a new position let's say like this um for him and uh and while um david is uh, thinking um you you joined the broadcast a few days ago uh but that was uh, only for uh i don't know a couple of hours maybe yeah um, so um, I just wanted to to ask you because we might have some new followers or viewers today, and uh, you recently uh, published a, a course on Chessable. Yes. So uh, so people were were interested in that, and uh, yeah, please tell us a little bit about the course and and why people should uh, should check it out. Sure. Yes. So the course is called Neutralize the Catlam. Uh, so it is a black rib portal for the black side uh, against the Catlan. So the Catlan is when white goes um, d4, knight of 6 c4, e6, and then Pianchetto, their bishop, with g3, bishop to g2. This opening is quite tricky, and uh, I myself, for a long time, with the black pieces, I had some difficulties with it, as it's quite po positional, just putting some pressure. So... I have been trying to make a reporter for the black side uh, aim that sort of uh, like sound po positional play, uh, but also keeping some winning chances and uh, showing uh, like many typical middle game po positions that is very likely to uh, arise. Um, and I I think 
what I've chosen is like a very nice solution, uh, which like white should not be better objectively, but but also black has many chances to play for the win. And often we we are a pawn up and like these kind of things, it's very dynamical. So in case you are struggling with the Catalan, you're not sure how to play for a win at, at all. Uh, and you're often just getting worse positions. Uh, I think this course can be for you. Um, Great. And um, we have um, pinned uh, the link to, to your course in the chat. So uh, feel free uh, to check it out. And uh, yeah, it sounds uh, sounds like a very yeah. And uh, also on the course page, like if you have any questions, uh, feel, feel free to ask to use the forum there. Uh, I'm quite active and you can ask any questions you want. And I'll try to respond. So yeah, perfect. Or or write in the chat here uh, sure. today. Yes, uh, as long <laughs> as we have you here. Uh, yeah, perfect. And um, Anita saying uh, hello. Morning from Texas. Morning. <laughs> here, Anita. And um, I mean, it's been uh, this is the final game of the match. Uh, I have been been following each game, so so I just wanted to take the time to to summarize a little bit. Uh, it started off uh, with Nils uh, playing with the white pieces in game one, and he had a really significant advantage, uh, we believed. I was commentating with Lawrence Trent for the, the first uh, three days. And um, in the beginning of the match, it felt like uh, the player with the white pieces were doing very good, and uh, but somehow were, were struggling to, to capitalize on the advantage. And then finally, we, we, got, uh, we got the first win, in uh, game five, I believe, uh, when, um, or was it game four? Game four, maybe. Yeah, game four, where David had the white pieces. And um, it was this very interesting game that uh, led to a position where David had uh, three versus two uh, pawns in, in a rook end game. And um, Nils actually had this magnificent uh, defensive idea, but it, it felt so counterintuitive. Uh, to to place the pawn on e6 in that position, and um, and then finally David found the, the technique to to win the game. So that was a brilliant game, a very technical game, I would say. And then of course we had um, Nils's win uh, with the white pieces when you joined us. Uh, yeah, yes. We were saying that that was almost like uh, in the style of Paul uh, Morphy, you know, sure, sacrificing yes. pieces. Uh, he let his uh, queen hang, you know. Um, and although uh, there was also in that game a very interesting defensive idea with uh, knight to g4, yes, uh, giving back the material, uh, David was in severe time trouble, so so he, he didn't find uh, the best defensive move, and then, um, yeah, and then suddenly the, the match was tied, and um, and then we had, uh, yeah, two days ago, uh, David fought back once again. Uh, I would say then he played a more tactical type of game, um, or at least uh, he got a, he got a good position where uh, Nils uh, was on the defensive and David found some yeah some great play in the middle game and and uh, what I liked about that game a little bit like the one Nils won is that uh, when you see a, a good middle game where all the pieces are coordinated they are working together. It's like a symphony, you know, we, we discussed this the other day and that's what I love about chess when all the pieces are coming together and uh, doing, uh, doing a great job. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's great to watch uh, those type of games because it all, uh, all uh, yeah, it's, it's all for a reason, you know, all the pieces are, are contributing and uh, yeah. Now, uh, yeah, and so now David is up five to four and uh, finishing this match with, with the white pieces, which uh, statistically uh, white has done very well. So it is a bit of a challenge for Nils today, but uh, hopefully we will get uh, an interesting position where he can go go for the win. Sure, yes. And uh, I I think it will not get so much easier for Nils also as this line, as I mentioned, is uh, okay. At, at least it's known for being quite safe for, for the white side. Uh, so Nils definitely has to play very well here to to create some chances. I think um, also this game which David won in this Rukan game. It's often like when you're slightly better, you always have to just push and push and press. And uh, yeah, he showed very great te technique winning that game 
for sure. Uh, but it's like cool seeing like you can win in different styles. Mm-hmm. Uh, this uh, this game which Nils wants, uh, yeah, it was like like a Morphe game. Uh, and also like when you see such games, perhaps it looks easy, yeah, like yeah, sure, my pieces should go there. But yeah. when you try playing it yourself, you realize it's not uh, so easy, yes. So uh, that's what uh, like shows true must mastery of chess to play such games. Yeah, so, absolutely. And uh, we see that uh, Nils takes on, on C4 quite uh, quickly. Um, yeah. And um, I guess we expect David to take back. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's like, once again, white has the ambitious pair, So, but black has a bit better coordination. Like, he has castled. He's going to get his bishop back with tempo. Uh, going to go C, C5 and get the knight out. He has good play. So, but uh, also white is not so far av- away from get, uh, like playing e, E3 e and bishop to E2 and, and so on. Uh, so Nils has to act, act quicker, uh, but also try to not go directly down a path where it's just a draw also. So it's really not easy uh, situation here. But um, yeah. Okay, so it takes back on c4, and now, now we're expecting bishop a6. Yeah, so I'm thinking uh, bishop a6 is quite likely to 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 be played. Uh, then I I think white has a choice of either playing queen to a4 or queen to c2. I think queen to a, a4 is what they play. Ah, but then uh, Nils uh, plays c5 before he, he goes uh, bishop to a6. Okay. Interesting. Uh, yes, uh, as far I have not seen this move as far as I know, or maybe I've seen it, but I don't remember. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so let's have a look. Let's say we were is it even possible to be greedy and take two times on, on c5? Yeah, so I I think certainly that's an option. So here to go D takes C5. I I'm not sure uh, what then Black should play. Uh, could also go Bishop to A6 here. Uh, could just take take back with the uh, pawn here and to say that sure you can win a like a pawn here, but you still have issues with your king position. It's not so likely that that you're going to castle the queen side. So you still have to use some time getting your pieces out. And maybe like knight b b the seven getting your bishop out of open c file could could give back some compensation maybe. Uh, it's also likely maybe after after d takes c five that uh, Nils is just going to go bishop to a six and perhaps we are likely to transpose into lines which I mentioned with uh, bishop to a six and then c five. Uh, but uh, I'm sure since Nils has played this very fast and as you mentioned he's one of the best prepared players in the world. That he he probably has some playable idea here, um, and and something which will um, lead the game to an unbalanced and very fighting position here. Uh, yeah. But that, so it makes sense to me that D takes C five is what um, here David should play. So. But but I like the idea not to take back maybe on C five for for Nils, but maybe just develop Bishop A six and then yeah. try and get the pieces out. And uh... yes, it uh, feels a bit more natural here to go Bishop to A. Six like B takes C five takes a bit of the steam out of the position maybe. Yep. Um, the, like I've I've seen many times also that like black uh, allows white to just take on B six and even if if you wish to take on A seven, just yep. give me the pawns. But I'm getting the de- development in the meantime. Uh, that's one of the in- interesting things. I uh, think I read this uh, in a book. Uh, like a, so, it's it's like we know that we should de- develop our pieces. Uh, we we know that development is important and these kind of things, uh, but the question is like when when you're a pawn up but you don't have good development, like what is the most I- important? And this this leads to very like in, interesting questions: uh, is the activity more important or the development? Uh, and I think a like questions scenario like this we are quite likely to to go down to where it will be very in, in interesting to see mm-hmm. so. and david has taken on c5 and um i guess uh, i guess we'll see a quick reply from um, from nils wow so he just takes back on c5 wow okay so he clearly he's still in book here mm. oh. But again, okay, I guess okay. it makes some sense because uh, he will be able to play bishop a6 no matter what next move. 
and then once he gets out uh, the knight from from b8 you see the rook rook can come into the position quite quickly mm. um maybe maybe you even even play uh the pawn to c4 i don't know just to annoy white a little bit um, yes also get... here uh, a few times it like this diagonal is quite weakened so it might seem like uh, white is winning after bishop takes f6 queen takes f6 and queen to e4 it might seem very promising it's not sure how, how to defend but black has has the resource queen takes b2 hitting the rook and maybe preparing to go uh, bishop to b7 at the moment um and so i and also queen to c3 so this this would certainly not work for white and the development uh, will be way too bad so bishop takes f6 does not work and so it, like it's a question if white should actually actually take this pawn it's also a weak pawn you, you could say yeah but also by by playing like this it has also opened up for the queen maybe to come to b6 maybe at a good moment to a attack down on b2 maybe also um so uh, if David is out of book here, this could definitely lead to very, like, it's not easy to figure this out mm -hmm. over the board. And it definitely seems like uh, Black has a lot of compensation for the bomb. Sure. Yes. Open lines um, getting out to pieces. And also in some, some positions, I think uh, maybe White's B2 pawn can be a bit weak. Yes. Uh, especially as long as the, the, the Black pawn uh, remains on c5 um and as you said the the problem for white in this position is that uh, the king is still in the center and you have to spend three more moves actually to to castle and that's um yeah that's a bit bit of a challenge for white I would yes say. so it's like the king safety is of course is of course very important so like you might like uh, like you said in this one uh, Nils game where Nils won. Uh, sure, David was up in material, but his king was in such a position that it didn't matter in in, in the end. Sometimes just having the weak king can, in the long run, result in uh, because the attack is so big that you have to give back material, and in the end you are not up in material but just down. Yes, yeah? so it's in, in, interesting these things um, here. So I I expect now David to think for quite a long time as as he likes to do, and mm -hmm. especially. Uh, especially now since the position is not easy to figure out also so and, um, and as you said if if david hasn't analyzed this position uh, in his preparations it must be quite difficult to 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 come up with with the best moves and um we might see that nils has has caught him a bit um off guard uh with this definitely yes idea. Yeah, but I think one. this is like the only matter in which you can play this variation with, with the black pieces if you wish to play for a win. Uh, so I I think Nils has succeeded more or less in creating a, a dy dynamical game where, where uh, white is not risk-free, let's say. Like it's very possible to, to go wrong here with white. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking like David does not want to play something too fast and maybe lose in a fast way. Yeah? So he... Uh, wants maybe to choose like a more safe road here, trying to find something. Uh, I'm in interested like if white makes a move like e3, it doesn't look like such a good move. If black just goes bishop to a6 anyways and just develop, but, but maybe like uh, in a position like like this. Okay, I, I think a position like this should be quite good for for black, even though that you're a pawn down. The king just never castles here. Uh, so I think a position like this should never be an issue for for the black pieces. That this pawn will always be a target, and a5 can come if b4, just creating further lines. Um, so I would be quite like unpleasant here with with uh, black, uh, with white rather. Mm -hmm. Trying to think here. Um, maybe rook to d1 could be an idea, maybe. But it seems like. Uh, as this line is now op opened up, you can consider like playing queen to a5 check maybe, maybe and just saying, yes, you can get your bishop down, but then the pin is not so annoying. I was hoping like if I played uh, rook to d1 and queen to b6, maybe I could bail out with something like bishop to f6 and then swing my queen over, maybe get some attack on the king. Uh, but queen to a5 seems like quite, quite a good move here. Bishop d2, something like, like this shouldn't be an issue for 
for black bishop c c3 we have maybe knight to d5 with big pressure bishop a6 is coming knight to c6 i think uh, black is doing quite well so rook to d1 doesn't seem like a good move e either but then i would be crushing what is the move for white like we have looked at e e3 and rook to d1 bishop takes maybe in in the end david just have to bite the bullet and take on c5 maybe mm -hmm. not sure but in some um, in some lines uh, where bishop comes to a6 and you played e3, would you consider taking back with the king and try and play d3, king d2? It's a bit slow, but... So in a pos po position like this, let's say, yeah? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so if you're able to, to play g3 and king to g2 and sort of artificial castles, uh, it, it should be quite good here. Maybe... Uh, black here should uh, foresee this and like not g3 king to g2 but first go queen to d3 check mm. maybe here uh, it's very important for black here to play as en energetically as possible and say king to g1 uh, knight to e4 or knight b the seventh uh, i i think if white were able to go g3 king to g2 and say rook f1 uh, he should have quite a safe position but it seems just now that that you're not fully in time and uh, the in initiative for 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 black seems very strong but it's a good I idea i think queen to the d3 is probably what what we re refuses maybe yeah it's, um... it looks quite strong actually for for black and um yeah the the black pieces are really quickly coming out and uh yeah as you said knight maybe even knight to d7 and then bring the rooks into the position as well also should yeah. also be as many options um so not an easy like it's also one of those uh, things with uh, like the Grunfeld. Uh, sure, it's very like a good op opening, ob objectively speaking. But if if you are surprised there, it's very hard to deviate without getting much worse. While in in the Nimso, it's such a ris um, rich opening, and you can just deviate slightly. Maybe you are slightly worse, but it's always very playable. And mm -hmm. so it's also the plus side of playing the, the Nimso. So that it's so sound that even if you're a bit uh, like not sure what to do, it's hard to go really wrong. Also, so um, yeah, absolutely. And um, while David is thinking, we have a question from uh, Maxim: uh, How many games in this match? And uh, yeah, this is the tenth and final game of the match. Uh, David David is leading five to four. And he's playing with the white pieces. But uh, yeah, I think we agree that uh, Nils is really trying to to get some play out of the opening here. And sacrificing a pawn. Uh, going for quick development. And uh, an interesting dynamic uh, position. Um, so I think we will have a, yeah, we'll have a long and, uh, and a fighting game ahead of us. Yes. And I hope that David will not think for 20 minutes here. <laughs> it's an... <laughs> Possible, maybe, but <laughs> I mean, having said that, he has played quite quickly uh, so far in the opening. So maybe I think this is a good moment for him to have a think, and especially if, as I said, if he's not prepared uh, or if he hasn't seen this this position on the board in his preparations, it, it really makes sense for him to to have a good think and uh, yeah. figure out. Uh, the continuation. Yes. Um, As I'm not really a queen to see two Nimso player, uh, it's like a bit hard for me to to understand this position like right away. Uh, but maybe since since we have talked about the idea of e3 and like getting on bishop out, but but we realize after bishop to a, to a6 that is always a bit issue. Maybe because of that, maybe what can try to move g3. Maybe it's a way to slow, but just the idea to go bishop g2 and castle kingside maybe could be an idea. Just to get yeah. the king in, into safety. Absolutely. And uh, and as you said, I mean, the pawn on c5 um, is quite weak. So if, if you delay uh, taking it, you might be able to, to put some pressure on it anyways later in the in the end game. And, and maybe it's better to focus on, on king safety rather yeah. than being greedy and, and take the pawn uh, straight away. Yeah. Okay. I, I think maybe... Like the more I look at it, maybe G3 is the best practical solution, maybe for for David. Maybe Queen takes C5 is better objectively, but to uh, face David's preparation, uh, Nils' preparation there, 
uh, it's not easy. Like uh, like what Magnus said when he was caught in preparation once by Fabiano, like all you feel is fear, yeah? Terror. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not nice. Uh, so maybe just G3 with Adia going bishop to G2. But also, black shouldn't have any problems here. M- maybe first to go knight B- B- D7 to sort of uh, keep this flow, like, uh, and say bishop G2, maybe queen to B6, put some pressure on the B- B2 pawn. I I don't think white is worse by any means, but also black shouldn't be worried about how things are going here. I think it's uh, quite fine for both here. Yeah. Uh... And, that, and that, I mean, that's a very interesting point that you made because uh, let's say you know, even you know, taking on c5 might be objectively uh, a little bit better. But then, uh, as you mentioned, then you play into your opponent's preparation. While yeah. uh, this other move, g3, uh, object, objectively, it might be just completely equal. But then at least uh, you feel a little bit more safe and you might deviate some, uh, somewhat from your opponent's uh, preparation. Yes, like uh, it uh, feels like the only way to sort of get your king like in the normal castle position, let's say. Yeah. But, but at least your king won't, won't be on f1 or or on g1, as they once said, yeah, with king takes f1. So, uh, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and now, for example, it's difficult, I guess, to play bishop uh, bishop a6, so you, you probably have to play, um, yeah. Maybe knight might be d7, as you mentioned, looks looks logical. And then it seems like uh, white is in time to, to castle and and potentially go for the c5 on later in the yeah. game. And also, like, if uh, black gets passive and trying to de- 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 defend this weak c5 pawn, it could also result in the black pieces being slightly passive. And because of this, it could be uh, some problems. But I think... In, in a middle game position, let's say I, I think it makes sense for Black to okay, maybe Nils won't, won't, wants to play it in hyper aggressive fashion and, and go for something like this. I'm not sure, but say that we, we get something like this bishop b7, say castles, uh, queen to b, b6. Like, let's say that the play uh, gets, gets more slowly, more po- positionally. Sure, the c5 pawn is weak, but I think the b2 pawn is more or less as, as weak, so it's possible that we get some kind of position where the c5 pawn falls and the b2 pawn falls or maybe at some point maybe b4 the end like so, some kind of position like this also mm-hmm. where maybe the a file could be open and could be some pressure but um like it's in- interesting i'm not sure if, if the c5 pawn is so much more weak than the b b2 pawn uh, ironically uh, if the pawn was on a a2 rather then i don't think the, the b2 pawn would be so weak as then b3 could be more more solid so having played a3 actually makes the the b2 pawn slightly more vulnerable in my own opinion so and that's interesting because uh, i think we've uh, mentioned that earlier in the match as well when mm-hmm. when david uh, has had similar positions that after you play a3 uh, those two pawns can become uh, a bit a bit weak on, on the queen side yes um and um yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's small nuances, but uh, with the pawn on a two, as you say, it just feels a bit more. Um, uh, it's a better better structure. Sure. Yes. No. It it uh, actually makes quite a difference, and these uh, light squares are okay. The um, good thing with having played a three is that maybe you could push b four and try to get some uh, play in that sense. But more more often than not, you are not so happy with uh, having played a three. But uh, having played a free gay white uh, bishop pair uh, earlier in, in the game, yeah, so it's quite hard to back then to realize that this could be an issue in a position like, like this. So, uh, yeah, but um, okay, if I were a writer, I would probably play g3. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, and, and, and especially thinking of the, the match situation. Uh, why would you risk now taking on c5 or or going for something that is really sharp? You might not be sure uh, what to do in the continuation. And when you have this sneaking feeling that Nils has prepared everything. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, I completely agree with you that it makes a lot of sense to to try and go for g3. But yes, we have rook to c1. Wow, that's okay. quite an ambitious move in my opinion. Um, one I idea could be that since the b2 pawn could be 
uh, a bit weak. A point behind rook to c1 could maybe be at some point to go rook to c2 maybe to protect the b2 pawn in that way. Uh, but it seems like a bit weird move, yeah, since, um, or maybe, maybe not weird move, but not as natural as you maybe would uh, think as your king position is quite important. And you anyway don't really want to take this pawn on c5, c5 here. So, but, um, okay, I'm not the most experienced in this kind of positions also. So maybe it's a very natural move for a queen to see two names of player. But, um, yeah. But I'm 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 impressed with David because I mean, as we said, it takes three moves now for White to castle and and to then play a move uh, on on the queen side is uh, yeah it's ambitious and uh, he's basically telling Nils okay I'm I'm not afraid I'm not afraid of this I'm, sure I mean this is quite a uh, brave move let's say yeah like. Uh... And uh, I mean, David perfectly understands that, that, that he has to get his king in, into safety, but even knowing that, he still decides to not do it. Uh, so that's for sure, since, since he has some uh, thought that, that uh, Rook to C1 is a very important move to play here. And, um, yeah, no, uh, probably Nils now is out of book, maybe. I mean, uh, sure, he has prepared Queen takes C5, and probably he has looked at some other options, but surely not as deep as the most critical move. Yep. Uh, like, if you go as deep in every line to, like, at some point, your head just explodes, yeah? So you have to be <laughs> practical. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, maybe, okay, I'm sure Nils is familiar with the main ideas here and how to put pieces, but maybe not specifically after Rook to C1, which which could could be a bit um, unpleasant. And often, uh, you, you, you could end up mixing up moves as you think you have seen something, but it was not exactly in that position. Uh, as nowadays you have to look at so many lines, difficult to keep track of everything. Uh, so I expect Nils to be having some small thinker, uh, at least trying to uh, know exactly what to do here. Mm -hmm. uh. And uh, Gerard uh, in the chat saying, vamos, David. And I know a little bit Spanish, so I know yeah. that means, you know, go, go, David. <laughs> and, uh, are there any Nils fans out there? Uh, let us know in the chat and uh, if you have any questions or comments uh, join join in on the conversation <laughs> yeah but i mean i'm 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 quite happy you know out of the opening uh, as a commentator spectator um that we will we we will see an interesting and exciting game i believe uh, in this final game of the match yeah. and, uh, and credit to to nils for coming up with this um entertaining and interesting idea uh, in this opening. Yeah, uh, and I think, uh, okay, Nils is one of the best prepared players in, in the world, so he's always using these best en engines. Um, but I think one of the things which the new engines have taught us is that often lines that were thought to not be playable is actually very playable. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some senses, this, this makes chess a lot richer since it uh, just uh, makes it possible to play so many more lines and and many more concepts. Uh, so this C5 is, yeah, I'm sure it's very... I'm not sure if it's a novelty. Maybe someone could look it up, but it looks very cool. And um, and uh, yeah. absolutely. And, and, and as, we, as we discussed uh, in the opening uh, or, you know, before the game, um, Nils has to try and achieve a position where he can get some initiative, even with the, with the black pieces. And I would say that this uh, has been a success for him so far in, in yes. doing that. And uh, if we're looking at the bar, I mean, it's it's uh, equal. It's an equal position, but um, lots to play for. Uh, yeah, yes. For Black. And um, he might even get uh, get a small initiative going into the, the middle game. So yeah, I would think so far for, for Nils. Yeah, sure. I mean, you really can't ask for, for an, anything more than this uh, inside this specific line uh, and yes the position might might be equal but it's with a lot of dy dy dynamical questions also uh, since the pawn structure of white is slightly better the black is better developed and this kind of things this this makes for an imbalance uh, and uh, both sides have to ask uh, to answer many questions and it's not always you do do them right so definitely a lot of chances here for both sides definitely here so I'm I I think here Nils is trying to understand like uh, uh, in which way is he's going to develop his pieces here. 
if he plays knight knight b b d7 maybe it won't be as easy to to play bishop to a6 and maybe as a result of this david now could go e if e, e3 and go bishop to e2 now as bishop to a6 isn't as as much uh, of an issue could could be in the point so and so maybe needs things about going bishop to a6 anyways maybe not yeah. sure Another thing, though, with um, playing rook c1 is that, let's say you go bishop a6 now, mm -hmm. um, and then you take on c5, because after knight b d7, you can try and play queen uh, queen c7. Maybe, yeah, queen to c7. I don't know if it achieves anything, but uh, maybe you can just play uh, queen e7. Yeah, and just going out of this... Uh, and then uh, rook c8 is a bit annoying. Yeah, um, it could also be an... Uh, in interesting to to just take on series seven there and say okay generally speaking i i do not wish to ex exchange queens but in in the process of doing in this say let's say you say rook fc8 takes takes i have managed to exchange off all of the active pieces of um, white and as a result of this the black pieces is really quite strong here yeah uh, and i think a position like this should give back plenty of compensation Rook to c2 is coming if you move your king, uh, the knight can e easily come into the game. Yeah. So I think also this is knight, but also queen to e7, which you mentioned, also feels uh, good. I mean, um, this is an ex extra option, but also the rook on c1, like it's an active piece. You maybe don't want to ex exchange it for the moment. So mm -hmm. This would feel quite risky also for, for David. Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe you have to go back then to, to c2. Yeah, queen to c c two could here be a move maybe. I'm not sure, but then uh, also why did you then play in rook to c one? Yeah, like it feels a bit artificial to having played this. Also, uh, another point which I see behind rook to c one is that he imagine that here Nils wants wants to play h uh, six. Maybe maybe now uh, David now can take on f six and, and after queen takes f six with with the rook on c one. He has an extra option here of going queen to c3 before taking on c5. Yeah. Sort of saying, okay, either we exchange queens and like it's very solid position, it's hard for white to lose, or you let me take on c5 without having the option of going queen takes b2. This this could also be quite a serious point behind rook to c1. Also. So um, yeah, now, now it's up to Nils to find the most precise way. I would think he would seriously consider just going bishop to a6 and just sacrificing the pawn on c5. But but this I guess this is not an option. If you go bishop a6, then this idea of taking on f6 and queen c3 uh, is not working, I guess, because then black has rook c8, I guess, in the yeah, end. Like it it's possible to also play play like this, but then black has gotten bishop to a6 instead of h6. And I th think this is a big improvement as uh, you could at some point maybe get rook to c8 at the moment. Okay, not right away, as you have some background issues, but maybe in the future, yes? I think it should give black quite decent play also. But it's also an idea for white, surely. So, okay, I'm I'm starting to understand the point behind rook to c1 now a bit more. So, great. Okay, so maybe because of this bishop takes f6 and queen to c3, maybe... It, it's smart for of needs to go knight b b d seven maybe just to not give this option and in case of bishop takes f six, okay you now you can also take with the knight but also with with the queen and the c five pawn is not really hanging, uh, so it's not as uh, effective. Also, um, so yeah, now it's up to Nils to find. Um, yeah, so knight b seven or. Okay, we have a we have an interesting question uh, from Island twenty two twenty. If we had in play a betting in chess, so for example, if you are watching a football match, uh, you can bet you know on the match even if it's uh, let's say nil nil at halftime, mm -hmm. you can still bet you know if this team will win or yeah. So his question is if if we had that in chess, would the current position indicate the game will play out as a draw or a win? Uh, for one of the players. So what would you put your money on uh, after seeing this position out of the opening? Yeah. Um, it's, 
difficult to say. Um, I I think when such good players are playing against each other, I think the odds will always be in favor of, of a draw, like more than 50%, let's say. Uh, but, but the position is quite unbalanced. So, um, okay, it would depend what the odds are. Yeah, Like if I get much money from if one player wins. Um, but, uh, okay, I'm not sure if... Uh, Maybe I will put my money on Nils. Maybe I, since it seems like Nils is quite good prepared here, a play might not be be the seven. Seems like he's quite in into the nuances of the position. So um, okay, to answer the question, I would put my my money on on Nils. What would you do? Ah, tough question. Um, yeah. I would. Yeah, I mean, depending on the odds. I mean, in general, you would get. Um, I think you'd get uh, good odds on on the black player, you know, in in a game like this. But uh, from the current position, um, I would I would be safe and and, and put my money on a draw. But yeah. uh, we never know. I agree with you. I think if one of the players are winning this game, uh, I think it will be Nils. But um, I still think David, such a strong player, will be able to to figure out uh, some of these early uh, challenges and uh, and uh, yeah get the draw in the end i think he'll be happy with the draw as well yeah so yes um, i mean if he, if he can you know if he can stabilize the position you know get the king into safety um i think he he's doing okay and um why why risk anything you know when you're leading the match with with one game to go um, yeah, sure so. yes i mean the next Moves are going to be very critical. Uh, if Steve's in finishing his development, uh, getting his pieces out and getting to castles, probably he will not have an ad- advantage, maybe, uh, as Black is very solid also, but uh, I I think that uh, the White is very solid also, so hard for David to lose. So I think that the next couple of moves are going to be very critical as to how this game is going to proceed. So yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, and um, I think David might have uh, have a long long think. Uh, let's have a short break. Uh, we're one hour into the game, a very interesting uh, position, and uh, we'll be back uh, back in a few minutes. So stay tuned. I moved away from the city 13 years ago. I worked as a journalist, I studied in university, but there was a sense of longing towards something a bit more real, where I could actually create things and and, uh, be much closer to nature. I'm a vegan farmer. That's a bit unusual, but uh, that's what I am. It's a long story. I used to be one of those people that thought that veganism is impossible, very deeply entrenched in, in like the small scale uh, animal farming uh, community. You know, I was a leading proponent for keeping pigs and, and doing animal husbandry, but with a human uh, touch. Well, as our business grew, our farm expanded and our shop started selling more and more meat and eggs and milk. It felt less as I was doing something good for the animals and more and more as I was just showing a happy face for uh, any kind of animal product consumption. It felt like I was a poster boy for, for the animal industry in itself. So I, I, uh, that didn't feel so good, to be honest. So we're picking for the bags and it's 15 bags that makes uh, about 3 kilos, just a little bit extra to be sure. I came across veganism on YouTube actually and um, a lot of the things they were saying started to make a lot of sense. The first year or so was really difficult. I made a lot of enemies, unfortunately, because most of my friends were also farmers with animals on their farm. 
And when I started posting on Facebook that I was a vegan and I was against killing animals and all that stuff, and that wasn't too popular with my farmer friends. <laughs> There were just so many questions also that we had to answer. What are you going to eat instead? It's not easy to make a dietary change, but it's even more difficult to make a change in a farm. Our whole infrastructure, everything we had on the farm, was based around animals. We sold the animals, uh, took down all the fencing, we tore down the animal houses, uh, and uh, if you don't have animals, you still have to uh, produce something on your farm, obviously, and we put a lot of effort into growing different beans and legumes. There's enormous potential in switching from animal uh, agriculture into vegan agriculture, purely from an efficiency uh, viewpoint. You know, if you grow one, hectare of beans and uh, compare that to one hectare of uh, grass for sheep, you will find that the beans produce, I think it's up to 10 times as many calories on the same amount of land. Animals aren't a very efficient way often to produce food, you know. You, your food kind of takes a, an extra way through the animal, you know. You grow grains, you give them to the animal, and then you eat the animal, you lose a lot on the way. Instead, if you grow grains and make that into a product that's eaten directly by humans, you know, you're just taking a shortcut and, and being more efficient also. We're approaching 9 billion people here on the planet. We need to be more efficient with the land we already have. And I think yeah, going into vegan farming, that will be one of the most important steps we can take. I still have friends who have animals, uh, I don't mind that. There's many places that are not suitable for vegan farming. You can only grow grass there. This is one of them, it's a beautiful place. There's no one model that fits everybody. Uh, different farms have different uh, possibilities and you have to adapt to the way your farm is. And uh, this is uh, yeah, a beautiful place where animals graze. Uh, I like that also, but there should be alternatives. <laughs> We're not bound by tradition anymore. You can just, instead of doing like your parents or your neighbors do, Google your way and just find, uh, you know, some guy in New Zealand is doing a thing and copy that guy instead. Welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here and we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the you know, this, this non-chess team. So I see some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand and we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you guys about the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind the scenes insights. <laughs> See you then.
Welcome back to this final game, uh, game 10, uh, in this special challenge match between David Howell and Nils Frandelius. Uh, they're playing in the heart of London at the Swedish Embassy. And uh, this is the current position uh, in a must-win game for, for Nils with the black pieces. And uh, we're liking his uh, chances out of the, the opening to it. And uh, we're also now joined by someone who, who knows uh, Nils uh, quite well, I would say. Uh, woman FM, uh, Ellen Kakulidis, welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, fun to join. Yeah, so you you came to London uh, last night. Yeah. To to support Nils for this important game, I assume. Exactly, uh, like the final support here to uh, make sure that he wins. Yeah, great. And uh, how are you liking his position now after after the opening? Um, I'm very happy because it looks like a position that he's able to play for like all three results, which is the main thing, right? When you want to win with black, it's not so easy if white just decides to uh, yeah, try to completely equalize the position. It's hard to avoid that as black. Um, but here, uh, there's definitely a lot of play and I think it will be an interesting game. Um, so that's super nice. And I think Nils is also happy. It seemed like he got a prep in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what we've been discussing as well. Um, David has also been spending uh, some time, um, even though, I mean, E4 looks like um, a good good move from, from David, uh, taking some squares in the center and also uh, opening up for his bishop. Um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, and we were... We were also discussing, you know, what what approach Nils will will do for this game because obviously it's much tougher to play play black. Also yeah. in a, I mean, in general, but also in a situation where you know white will be happy with a draw. Yeah. So it's it's one of the toughest things in in a top level chess, I would say. But uh, definitely, he's he's done a good job so far to create um, an interesting dynamic position. And, uh, definitely, like. Uh... It's always this situation. I try to say to him, just do something random. I don't know, play G5. And <laughs> he always looks at me like, no, no, that's not how it works. We just need a position that's playable and we'll see what happens. And he also Yeah, you were talking much uh, um, about this. Yeah? Like, I, I don't feel like Nils is a player that will go for something like very dubious, uh, but something that's just playable and maybe not like as correct, let's say, as what he usually does, but just something a bit more playable and I think the position which which he has now is is of that character. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, now and now he played h6. Uh, he was like with e4. White was maybe even threatening to go e5. Uh, so now he he just includes uh, h h6. Asking actually David quite a hard question: Should your bishop go uh, away from this diagonal, or should you maybe go go to h4? Uh, if if you go to h4, maybe g5 could be an idea at some point, making it even more sharp. Uh, so, okay, I think H6 is quite a good move. It's anyway just nice to have included this move. Also, like, uh, giving your some back rank air also, you you never know. And um, yeah, so now it's up to David, yeah? It's always, um, if the bishop goes to H4, it's kind of a common idea to go H6, D5 in Nimsa, right? So then suddenly David has to think about this every move, which uh, I think time-wise is good that David has a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also like in positions like this, like say bishop to h4, may okay, maybe not g5 right away here, maybe it's too much, but in general, like you're never sure if it's uh, the black king or if like g5 takes takes many square, it, it's it's in black favor or white favor, very hard to say. Uh, so yeah, I expect here David to take quite some time to to see what what to do also now with knight being on d7 i do not think it makes sense for him to take on f6 as of the queen takes f6 we were seeing this idea with queen to c3 but now the the, the c pawn is protected by the knight so it doesn't really make any sense i think black is doing very well maybe rook to b8 here with some pressure on the b2 pawn so yeah h6 on on the board uh, it's quite interesting to allow the structure with h7 c5 to get this b file for the rook. It's uh, it creates some dynamic possibilities for black. Yes, yes, and uh, as me and Askil was talking ab about the fact that the pawn is on a a3 actually makes this b file even more dangerous. As like yeah. imagine that the pawn was on a a2, white can maybe just go b3 and the b file. Okay, it it looks nice, but it might not do so much. But yeah. as the pawn is on a3, I think it actually makes the function. 
Um, and here, not an easy decision for David. Uh, I would think maybe he's thinking about maybe going bishop to, to d2, uh, but it uh, probably makes the position way too unharmonic. My idea was just to go bishop to c3 maybe at some point to protect the b2 pawn. It seems just after bishop to, to b7, say bishop to d3, and just uh, black pieces are coming way, way too fast. And it's, this can easily lead to a disaster. We need to see to maybe just c4 and position is fully op opening up. So this just, okay, bishop to d2, maybe not the most natural, but also not uh, such a crazy move. Yeah? And just then, black is almost winning. So it shows it's not an easy position. What about bishop e3 to pressure on c5? Yeah, bishop to e, e3 is also in, interesting. I, I would be a bit scared about maybe not g4 at some point, but maybe not right away here. Um, so black can maybe go queen to b6, so that would maybe run in, into some b4s. Maybe that's also a point behind bishop to e, e3. Maybe you should just go like bishop to b7 here, uh, attack the, the, the e4 pawn. It seems to me uh, knight to d2 is, is the best move as if bishop to, to d3. This idea, once again, with knight to b6 maybe. Uh, and and c4 seems very strong, so you probably should should go knight to d2. But the, the development which which black has is actually quite significant here, and knight to g4 seems like quite a strong move, also. So it's like I'm I'm liking Nils' position very much. I think it's quite promising, actually. And like now it seems to me that that he really can't take on c5 as as it loses on the spot due to takes and rook to c8. Yeah, yeah. So it's hanging. So. Um, yeah. Okay, maybe bishop to h4 is the most natural move here, maybe. And uh, and while David is thinking, I'm just catching up on chat. Um, yeah, so they are playing uh, at the Swedish Embassy here in London, which is quite interesting because uh, it feels like both players are, uh, you know, has the home, home advantage in a way. Because uh, I guess the Swedish Embassy is Swedish... Uh, land in, yeah, territory. in territory in 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 the heart of london and obviously david is from england and has been living in london before so uh yeah uh, that's uh, that's interesting um and the score uh, david is leading five to four this is the final game of the match um so obviously nils is looking to to go for the win with the black pieces today hoping for some excitement and uh Jan wondering is it cold where you are Askil and uh, no I wouldn't say so <laughs> not particularly cold um it's, it's a bit cold outside uh here in London uh, at least during the evenings but I'm Norwegian so you know I'm used <laughs> used to the cold in the winter time so that's, that's not a problem well I just uh, flew in from Denmark and the temperature rose like 10 degrees automatically ah, yeah. so. <laughs> I would say it's uh, not cold here. So, so you you are one of those who brings the weather wherever you go, like the the yeah, cold. Yeah. <laughs> Usually, it was raining all day yesterday, and yeah. uh, both players were complaining, but uh, I took the responsibility for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. We we always have this thing like in Norway. It's the north and the south Norway, and my parents are from Tromsø. And they always, uh, like in Tromsø, it's not so good weather. And then they come to Oslo and like they bring the bad weather to Tromsø to Oslo very often. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's how it is. So I guess yeah, you yeah. are also used to the cold, uh, to Frederick. Yeah, no, I am from Tromsø in, in uh, North Norway. So it's uh, quite cold there often. Uh, there in the summertime, if it's 15 degrees, you're quite happy. Mm, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, but now I live in Oslo, so I'm more used to that. Yeah, like a bit more hot, yeah, but uh, still. Yeah, also, I mean, I'm quite yeah, used to it. Also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I would also recommend everyone, I mean, also a great city to visit, uh, especially in the summertime. So it's a great summer, summer city. And yeah, as you say, a lot of chess stuff going on uh, in Oslo. Uh, the famous Good Night Chess Bar. Come and check that out if you ever go there. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of chess players living in Oslo. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's a good, good community. And um, yeah, we have a good question from Tom. Uh, what happens if Nils wins and tie, uh, tie the match? Um, originally, I think they uh, were planning to maybe have some some tie breaks with Rapid or, or Blitz Chess. 
but uh, yeah, in the end, I think it will be uh, a tie if it's uh, if it's five five and they they share share the title. Uh, I think it makes sense. You play a ten game match, yeah. long games, and if it's super exciting, it's a bit uh, anticlimactic to decide what happens in a rapid or blitz game, right? So yeah, and and uh, I mean. This is a friendly, friendly match um, put um, put together by a private sponsor. So obviously, if it was uh, you know the World Championship, uh, they would have played tie breaks or uh, yeah. Also, I mean the players must be a bit tired. Uh, yeah. Ten, ten long tough games, um, and uh, probably wants to enjoy uh, a free free night in London after yeah. after the match uh, and instead of playing uh, many more hours. The time breaks. I was discussing this morning with Nils that uh, he says he plays a hundred games a year now. Wow. And that it was actually quite a lot. Uh, classical games? Yeah, classical wow. games. And I don't know, I don't think I ever played this many. I mean, yeah, that's that's quite incredible. Hundred games per year, classical chess. Yeah. That's, so, well, that's uh, impressive. Ten games in a row, it's uh, you get tired. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, obviously. but I think it's like with uh, like in the more old times, yeah, with uh, Kasparov and so on. He were playing like two or three tournaments a, a year, and yeah. they were saying to Magnus, "Yes, you should not play so many tournaments." But I think the modern way is just to play a, a lot, and yeah, a hundred games is quite much. But I think I'm also playing more or less like this also. Yeah. Um, he always yeah. uh, tell me, tells me this story of when he was fifteen or sixteen. I think he went to. To Russia also to play during the summer and he played within I think it was 50 days he played like 55 games wow. like across the summer <laughs> it must have been 56 some even number but mm-hmm. it was like a lot um no breaks and he played uh, also in Russia this uh, 18 round robin tournament wasn't this was what he said yesterday mm-hmm. so really playing a lot is uh, so he's a chess Lover. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So. yeah, I also had once when I played like insanely much. It was in 2017 summer. I played Norwegian Championship, Politician Cup in Denmark, then in Riga, then in Russia, like nonstop. And I, like at some point, you just uh, stop thinking clearly. Yeah, it's, I was not able you, to. Break you need a break uh, at some point, I guess, to, to catch your breath. And, yeah, uh, like for it. at least a, a few weeks. So. Learn from uh, from the games you've played. Yeah. Uh, that's that's always good. And uh, yeah, Be- Benedetti Orama says beautiful interior. It looks like an embassy. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, they're playing at the Swedish embassy, and it's funny because when I uh, flew from Norway to to London, I was trying to picture myself how the the playing venue would look like, and I would say it's pretty much uh, exactly what I imagined it would be. And uh, yeah, it's it looks like a very Cozy, nice little place to play chess, and uh, I think the players are happy with the venue. Yeah, it must be a great atmosphere to play in such a nice-looking place. Absolutely, and uh, we do have Bishop H4 uh, to it, which you. Uh, uh, no, uh, I was looking at it. It seems like should be F4. Oh, sorry, Bishop F4. Yeah, seems not sure, but also yeah. a reasonable move. Yeah, so I. I think just the uh, reason for bishop to f4 is like uh, el- elimination, yeah? Like you realize that uh, if bishop to d2 is a bit uh, like uh, too much a natural place, bishop to e, e3 runs into this knight to g4. And if bishop to h4, then, then the bishop is a bit out of the play. And after, say, rook to b8, it's a lot of pressure. So I think bishop to f4 uh, is, uh, okay, it, it, it was actually Daniel's top choice. So all the credit for David to finding it. Um, so yeah, also maybe a uh, point is is that now rook to b8 is no longer possible to the bishop being on f4. So now Niels has to find a way. The m- most natural move, in my opinion, maybe is queen to b6 here, just put some more pressure on the b4 pawn. Um, then, then we might expect b4 right after queen b6. Yeah, so the possibility, yeah, I'm 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 not sure. Could, like it. Simplifies the po- position, but also Black then has quite good development. I like say Queen to B6, uh, B B4. Like say C takes before, A takes before, and say 
a move like I, I don't know, bishop. Okay, maybe bishop b seven runs maybe into bishop to c seven. So you should be a bit more accurate. But say a a five. Like sure, you can trade off these pawns, but in in the end, black has better uh, pieces here, and uh, Nils is still two moves away from castling, which does count for something. Uh, so I think in a position like this, Nils will be very happy and have very good chances also. Uh, so okay. Uh, after queen to b6, maybe we will see uh, the reason why rook to c1 was play, played by David, and maybe rook to c2 will 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 be here played, uh, which also shows that that is very deep in into these positions. Also, P playing this rook to c1 move. Uh, so yeah, that's a that's a great point, and uh, and you mentioned that option earlier on as well. Yeah, yes. Replayed rook c1. Yeah, and, uh, I guess it makes a lot of sense to um, yeah. To keep things defended and not uh, commit too much of the bonds on the on the queen side. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, here is an. Um, I think it makes sense for Nilsson to think a bit, like for at least ten minutes. He has some time ad advantage, so it's. I think it makes sense sense to invest this time into trying to find the most pre precise way, since it's quite critical. I mean, still, if David gets some time, he will get his king into safety, uh, and sh and should be doing fine here. I think uh, if you, as black, can delay this development of the white great bishop, then uh, you would try to do so, right? It would yes. be nice to keep the king in the center, then there's always a lot of stuff that white has to consider. Yeah, yes. Also, it's not so easy also for Nils, since if Nils uh, would have included the move a, a5, he could play like bishop to a6 and then take on f1, making sure that white can't castles. But if you now play a move like a a five, let's say, uh, even if like uh, uh, David plays on a bishop to e two, now it's not the same in, anymore. As now you you can take with the queen, and I think in a position like this, uh, the c five pawn is actually maybe slightly more weak than the b two pawn, as what is quite well coordinated. Um, so it's uh, all of for it is to try to make use of the de development lead here. Absolutely, and uh, we do have a couple more questions from the chat. Um, Ed, uh, wondering our feed, the points awarded? Uh, yes, they are. So um, the players are uh, close to the same rating, so um, nothing uh, dramatic uh, will happen after each draw, and uh, both players will get five points for a win. So in that sense, uh, David is now up five five rating points so far in the, in the match. And uh, Tom asking if any famous chess player has played in the same venue before, and I don't think so. Not, not that I'm aware of, at least. I think it's quite unique to play in an embassy. Yeah. Mm. So uh, it was, uh, yeah, Malcolm Payne, one of the organizers who, who uh, got in touch with the, the Swedish ambassador, and uh, they, they figure out that uh, possibly the, the, the match could be played there. And, uh, yeah, I haven't heard of other chess matches being played at an embassy before. But first of all, chess matches are not so common, right? So That's how true, often yeah. is a match played? It's. Uh... I mean, back in the day, it was more common. So maybe back yeah. in the day, but uh, yeah, you're you're right. In in recent times, uh, fewer and fewer matches like this uh, has been played. But I really like like the match format. I think it brings a very good excitement to the games. Um, yes, I really like the match format. So, yeah. There's a bit of psychology in it, right? Every day you have to think about do I stick to what I played previously? Do I switch openings? Like um, maybe Nils, I don't know, he lost two days ago, right? And then, like for the next game, he might think differently, which is not kind of the same when you play different players. Um, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very like I. I remember reading this uh, book on the Kasparov Kramnik match uh, when Kasparov lost some games in the Grundfeld. He he just didn't know what to do against D4. So like, and he made his team like work out just all kind of things to play versus to 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 play the name. So I think it was he changed to. But like, yeah, you always have to think what works. Uh, and during a match, like if you have a big team, you, you have the privilege of. Changing also, but um, yeah. Um, 
But I agree, like Ian said, I think in, in, in chess, the psychology is a big factor, but even more important in, in a match because uh, it's the same opponent, you know, every day uh, you play, might play the same openings. And then you start to, you know, uh, think a bit like poker, you know, and, and reverse psychology. He thinks I will play this opening, but then, you know, so it's, it's becoming more of a, yeah, a bit more mind games, you know, uh, compared to playing a round robin tournament or an open tournament with uh, with different opponents. So Yeah, definitely. And also, like, how much do you trust the analysis you did before, right? Mm -hmm. Do you play the same thing uh, because you trust that all the variations are good even after the opponent checked? Or do you want to switch it up to make sure that this doesn't happen? Yeah, absolutely. So um, definitely that's a big part of playing a match. Uh, yeah, I mean, it does look like Nils has some uh, some options there uh, to it. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so in a dynamic position, you are often thinking about di dynamic moves. And here, an interesting option is, is to play the move E5 here with the black pieces. The point is that, uh, okay, you are sacrificing the pawn, but if white takes this pawn, it would open up the lines to, to the white king. Uh, very much, and after say knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, and just move like rook to e8. Uh, black gets very good play here, uh, and like more important than being a pawn down is the development. And say after bishop takes f f6, maybe queen takes f f. Black might be a pawn down, but uh, very big pressure on the b2 pawn, very pressure on the e e2 pawn. Bishop is coming out. I think e if five is a very strong shot. And I think Nils is thinking of, uh, about this very seriously. As he is a Grunfeld player and a very active player, I think this, this will come quite natural to him. Um, and yeah, so also the point behind e, e5 is that, no, is that now the bishop is no longer protecting the b8 square. So now the rook can join in on the action on b8. So that's the point behind e, e5. So. Yeah, looks like a very, very interesting option for Nils. Mm. And what do you do with white after e5? You just move the bishop, or yeah. So I I think it's too risky to take this pawn as you are down uh, behind in the, the development. You don't really have time to take it. So you either go bishop to e3 or bishop to g3. Maybe bishop to e e3 makes a bit more sense, uh, just to put more pressure on the c5 pawn. And once again, if queen to b6, maybe b4 is is a good move. So, so then I guess something like rook to b8 is what Nils should play. Uh, put a lot of pressure on the uh, b2 pawn. It's a possibility here to, to go rook to c2, but maybe it feels a bit, uh, I'm not sure how to say, but like it, your de development is lacking, like you still haven't developed your bishop on f1. And I think in a position like this, Nils is once again doing very well. If, if you can trade the c5 pawn for e4 pawn, it should be heavily in Black's favor as it opened up, up the line, but also against a central pawn. Um, so after, after rook to b8, maybe Nils should go like queen to c, c2 maybe, and then try to de develop your um, pieces. But also now, uh, as bishop is on e, e3, this knight g4 idea can come in handy for Nils at any moment. Uh, so definitely not not easy decisions for both players. Bishop to g3 is certainly also an option, but then maybe the bishop is a bit out, out of play, but also the e5 pawn could hang at the moment. So hard to say here. The, but I I think I would play e5 with the black pieces uh, still to get the rook in, into the game. Yeah, and I think it's an important detail that the knight on f3 is very far from getting to d5. So it's not like oh, yeah, that, yes. that square too much right now, at least. Yeah, yeah yes. Like e, e5 does weaken the d5 square, but the pool, pool position is in such a dynamical yeah. character that uh, the, these kind of factors doesn't really matter for the moment. And yeah, the knight would have to uh, spend quite some time to get to d5. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's time you don't have here. So. Yes, yes, true. Do I get these arrows? No. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
Okay, but it feels like uh, you know it's it's um, it's a somehow critical moment in the in the game. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Next couple of moves here for for Black. If Black wants to to try and uh, create some initiative and taking advantage of uh, David having the king in the center still. Um, yes, like if. Uh... David there gets a few moves. He's just going to go bishop to e2 and short castles. And nothing really bad can happen. I mean, you might trade off the b2 and c5 pawn, but it will just be a small thing. So, yeah. I guess what Nils is thinking about must be like, should he include another move before e5 maybe? Mm. Is there some natural move that will strengthen e5? Yeah, no, I... I think such a move could could be something like queen to b6 maybe. Yeah. That's a yeah. typical like these kind of moves, just to in, include your piece and maybe then after queen to c2, let's say, or rook to c2, but say rook to c2, maybe then e5. But it feels like you haven't really achieved so much as you anyway want to rook on 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 the b file. So maybe like it would just be a com competition between the rook and and the queen on the b file, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, but yeah, I mean, uh, certainly e, e5 is not the only move to, to consider here, also. And, uh, and while Nils is thinking, I have a question for, for you, and uh, Nils strikes me as a very disciplined guy, you know, in terms of working with chess, and, and when he's not playing tournaments or traveling, how would you describe his everyday life, you know, uh, studying chess and, and working with chess? Yeah, it's a bit interesting because uh, so he works with chess all the time and basically uh, his schedule is very much based around when I wake up, he goes up and makes breakfast for me and then he just starts with uh, his chess work. Um, but it's, I call it work. He's very much just enjoying looking at chess. So he spends the whole day, you know, either reading about chess or studying openings or um, doing tactics. And his schedule is mostly very fixed when it's right before a tournament. Then he starts making a plan for what he has to do within the time. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it's just uh, basically looking at chess as much as he can because that's what he loves to do. Yeah, that's great. He, um... Yeah, even in weird situations, he has like... A, I always tell this story, but right next to his bed, like one of the books he always reads and almost is like uh, best games or Kaspar or whatever, you know, uh, stuff like this, where I would maybe read Game of Thrones or, you know, something <laughs> not just based. <laughs> but that's very in interesting. Like when I was a kid, I was always taught that those uh, really strong grandmothers, they always had like a game collection next next to to their bed turns out it's it's, it's actually true <laughs> it's yeah. definitely true in our household but um, it's uh i don't know uh, for other professional players like david's normal routine when he was playing a lot um but i think uh, for nils it's he has obviously some stuff he has to do like tactics uh, before tournaments is super important because you need to stay sharp um, and openings is something you continuously have to do because you need to stay up to date and have some ideas before you play a tournament. Um, but this other stuff, like reading chess books, that's more um, enjoyment always for him. That's interesting. And and uh, Tuid, maybe you should have uh, a couple chess books on your bedside now that you're <laughs> trying to become a grandmaster. Sure, yeah. No, it's very good. No, I really like reading books. Uh, like... I was not reading much books uh, until like a few years ago. Uh, so I was mainly just on my com computer working, but I, I think reading books has really given me some more insights into game and just loving the game even more, like really chess history. Uh, after I started reading much about chess his history, my love for the game just went even more. So yeah, I can really uh, like, like the same as Nils, just really love chess and it doesn't feel like work always. Oh. That's great. And uh, we actually have a question for you, um, to it, uh, from Tom. Um, how many Grandmaster norms do you need for, for to get the GM title? And you can probably maybe uh, explain us, you know, the process of becoming a Grandmaster, which yeah. is not so, your next goal. Right now, 
I have zero grandmaster norms, but you need in order to become a grandmaster, you need three grandmaster norms, and you get the grandmaster norm if you play in a tournament where you play against other grandmasters. You must meet three grandmasters in a tournament, and you have a performance rating of uh, twenty six hundred, uh, and also a few other requirements have to be like you have to face a certain amount of nationalities and so on. Uh, but you have to have uh, these three per performances and also have a feed rating of 2,500. So that's the that's process. Point. Right. Sorry? It's enough you have had the feed rating of 25 at some point. Yes, yes. Like you, you like it's fine if you had 2,500 and then you drop to say 2,480 and then you get the norm, then, then you're a grandmaster. It's, uh, I think it's also fine if you had it like unorthodox officially also, but I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. So, I mean, that's a good thing also. And okay. what, what is your current rating now? Uh, yeah, so now, okay, it's 2460, but I gained a bit in the league, so it's 2465. Okay, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm sure you'll, you'll get there. And uh, maybe we discussed this briefly last time you joined, but what are your uh, tournament plans now coming, uh, going forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I'm playing the European Championship in uh, Slovenia uh, at, at the end of this month. I think it starts from the 26th uh, and like a few days after European, I'm playing Fagernes uh, yeah. Chess. Uh, and the, depending on the world, Situation. I'm probably going to play um, more after that also, but that is my two e e events which I planned. I guess um, the European uh, Championship will be fun for you. Yes, yes. No, it's a great opportunity to play. If you there do well, you are going to face strong grandmasters every single round. Really, a lot to learn from. And uh, yeah, Nils will be playing. Yeah, uh, Nils will also be playing. Um, he usually plays this tournament. I think uh, exactly for that reason that uh, it is an open tournament, but uh, you meet strong players every day and it's very competitive and super nice usually. And uh, I believe Niels also mentioned that players like Peter Twiddler uh, will play. So quite strong, strong tournament. And, yeah, uh, yes. And it must be inspiring for you, Tor, to, to, to play all these uh, great players that you've kind of grown up with and you idolize maybe some of them and sure. you know, get the chance to play them. Yeah, no, it's just even cool just being in the same playing hall as them. So, so Who's yeah. Sorry? Who's your favorite player? Ah, my favorite player of all time is Fisher. Um, okay. Bobby Fisher. But okay, he's in close competition with, with Magnus, yes. But if I would have to say one, it probably would be Fisher. So, yeah. And, and yours? My favorite player of all time. Yeah. I think it must be Ulf Andersson. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> I training with Nils and he showed us just some Ulf An Andersson games where he won this uh, night and, and games were slightly better pushing him. Yeah. So great player. Like be, for Magnus, he was probably the best Nordic player of all time. Probably. Okay. M maybe all also Fredrik Olafsson was also there. But. Um, yeah, big legend. And, uh, ben ben Larsen. Yeah, yeah, Ben Larsen was quite strong. Okay, I'm forgetting Ben Larsen also, of course. <laughs> of course. So. But yeah, some great uh, Scandinavian players. Yeah. And um, yeah, Steven asking in the chat, is this the last game? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, all good things come to an end, as they say. And uh, this is the 10th and final game of this match here in London. And uh, David is leading 5-4. to four, So uh, this is a very important game. For both players, and uh, Nils is now trying to to win this last game with the uh, with the black pieces. And uh, I go saying morning, Askil. Good to see you, Tor and Ellen. Good to see you as well. Nice to have you here on the on the chat. And um, yeah, I mean it's been a great match. Uh, many entertaining games. I think I think everyone has been uh, quite happy. Both uh, organizers, uh, sponsors, and and uh, the Swedish uh, embassy. Uh, it's been some fighting chess. That's what we want to see, right? And uh, I have to mention, you know, this uh, special prize uh, fund. Uh, so the players are fighting for prize money in each game uh, to incentivize um, fighting chess and, and to see the players go for the win. 
Uh, so if they win a game, they get 1,500 pounds. If it's a draw, both players get 500 pounds. And uh, if you lose, you get 200 pounds. Uh, consolidation price. But uh, I mean, that's uh, some good money to fight for uh, in each uh, each game. So uh, yeah, I like the, the Yeah, setup. it's very like new concept. Yeah, like I've never heard this concept before. And it seems like it's working. Like they are fighting in every single game. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe they would have either way. But they... uh, possibly. But uh, but uh, what I like about this match, as I mean, we haven't seen uh, a short draw at all. I mean, we've had several draws, but uh, most of them have uh, arise from you know long fighting games, uh, five, six, seven hour long games, and uh, yeah, that's that's what we want to see as a chess fan and. What do you think about the time control then? Like they had this one time control the first five games, mm -hmm. then they switched to a shorter time control. Um, I mean, personally, I probably prefer a, a bit shorter time control, but uh, obviously we know David <laughs> loves playing long games and he's he must be one of the best, I mean, one of the top players with the most uh, amount, I mean, most uh, long games, you know. Mm. Both in terms of moves and uh, in terms in terms of hours yeah. per per game, and uh, I realized you know Nils has uh, has probably uh, another preference a bit shorter games as well. So um, yeah, it's just uh, a bit individual style and, and taste, I guess. Uh, yeah. But it's also good to see you know we have uh, we have many rapid tournaments now, so to see that uh, Pascal Chess. Uh, it's uh, it's still um, surviving, or you know, it's it's still um, uh, going relevant. Uh, relevant. Yeah, I think it's nice to have both uh, that both can uh, coincide together, and uh, yeah, it uh, it mixes up things a bit. And I agree. I this uh, this long time control also has the very interesting element that it becomes very physical. Mm -hmm. You have to survive for such a long time, uh, like completely drained of energy in the end, because you know it's so many hours. Think about if you had to play tennis for seven hours, you would also be exhausted, right? So that's uh, also an interesting aspect you get in the longer time controls that you lose a little bit when you play shorter games. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that uh, like. If you're trying to live as a pro professional player, it's very important to uh, exercise often and to be in good shape. So for yeah. at least, which, which you mentioned, like if you're dead at the fourth hour, you are not gonna exceed in in, in the professional chess. So yeah, yeah, I could uh, mention this to Nils's routines. He exercises almost every day. Wow. Okay. So that's uh, very much part of his normal life, also. Hmm. For this exact reason, I think uh, physical shape, when you have to stay like focused for so long, it's super important. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think uh, I think Nils has a small advantage over David there, because I don't think David has the time or energy to, to work out uh, at least every day. So maybe a couple times a week, but uh, it's a uh, yeah, tight schedule. And he's obviously working on the Champions Chess Store. Um, mm. So when, when there's tournaments going on there, um, his focus is, is on those tournaments. And it's difficult to, to find time, I think, to, to, to do a lot of exercise as well. But um, mm. yeah, it's, it's definitely a big, uh, it's become a, a more important part of top level chess, I would say, yeah. in the last 10, 20 years. Mm. Uh, and, and more and more players are aware of it. If you look at you know the top players in the world, uh, many of them are are in good shape and uh, are working out quite a lot. So it seems here that like Nils have been thinking for more than 20 minutes. It seems yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it means that this this position is really not easy. I'm sure that that he has seen the move e5, but he's probably thinking a bit further. Like, am I really getting e enough play for having put my pawn on e5? Maybe. If I don't get e enough, maybe it could later on be a weakness. Uh, I think this this is the kind of uh, considerations which is really not easy, and it's impossible to calculate your way to let's say the truth. Yeah, you just have to uh, sort of feel and base the feeling on on some variations, but it's impossible to look at all 
Um, and yeah, I like Nils is getting knight to g4, but also if he gets his bishop, it's not so easy to understand if it's e enough and, and so on. So, um, yeah, and maybe I, also yeah. this element, you know, that he's trying to figure out where do I get the most uh, play. Like maybe he's yes. willing to uh, lose 0 0.1 computer evaluation to get like a position where there's lots of play still, right? Yes. And uh, yeah, and just now Nils played actually, actually the move e, E5. It's on the board. So now we will see how David will re respond. But props to Nils for finding it. It's a very strong move. I would predict that David will think for a while here also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, an, it's really not easy to, to know if you should put the bishop on G3 or on e, E3. So not an easy decision for sure. I, I feel that, you know, um, short term, you want to have it on E3, but maybe long term, it's okay to have it on, on G3. And possibly, if you find the time, in, in some lines, you might even go, you know, F3, Bishop F2, and bring it out. Mm, uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good have a solid point. position, uh, also defending uh, the pawn on E4. Um, but obviously, uh, Black also has some moves to make, and... You might not have time to do it um, anytime soon, but maybe later in the game. That's an yes. idea. Like if the queens get traded off and uh, the black initiative slowly fades away, then then for sure this bishop g3 is a knight to d2. And then f3 bishop to f2 could be a very serious idea and possible way for uh, David here, here to play. But we are quite far off uh, that yeah. from hap happening right now. And um, I go uh, on the chat saying uh, my favorite player of the past is also Paul, Paul Morphy, which we mentioned earlier. And the uh, favorite living player is the Yasser. So I guess ah. they are referring to Yasser Saidovan, which is a great player and, and commentator and all, all around nice and funny guy. I met him in Oslo once when he was um, doing some commentary for the... Uh, world um, Fisher Random uh, Fisher, right, yeah. in Oslo. So uh, I got to to uh, go out with him and some other people after after the, the championship. And yeah, what a great guy. So many interesting stories of uh, yeah, Fisher and uh, yeah, the greatest players uh, to, to ever play the game. And they're also saying, agreed, the price structure is great. I would love to see more matches like this one. Uh, maybe a slightly shorter time control would be beneficial for viewers and casters, but the quality of uh, play has been excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been a pleasure, I mean, looking into all these games, commentating. Um, I don't think you've had uh, a single boring game at all. I mean... Uh, Maybe a couple of the draws haven't been that exciting, but overall, I mean, it's just been a pleasure to to uh, to watch these games and um, and uh, yeah, just overall well well played games, and, uh, fighting players. I have to say, it's also been super interesting, like watching this clash of styles. Mm -hmm. um, so, from a personal standpoint, I'm I'm playing chess much more like David. And to see like this play up against Nils, it's been super interesting to, to follow because you don't like see it so clearly uh, often. Yep, that's um, a good point. And um, yeah, I mean, it must be nice to know that your playing style, uh, you know, you can, you can beat strong players, yeah. you know, <laughs> on a good day. Uh, just need 400 elo more than well, it would be fine <laughs> sometimes you you sometimes there are upsets in chess you know so i think i've, I've beaten a, yeah i've beaten a guy in classical chess that was 400 rating points there wow impressive so uh don't stop believing that's the that's, that's the, the song thing. song goes um and uh Ichigo uh, has a comment uh, and a question. Uh, David commentating and analyzing the top grandmaster so much this year has to have improved his chess right. What's your guys' thoughts? And yeah, that's a very good question. Um, obviously, he's the, he's the main commentator on the Champions Chess Tour. And um, of course, yeah, watching uh, the top players play every month, um, following the games uh, closely for, you know, uh, eight, eight to ten days. 
um, must help him, I would, I would assume, um, and would also help him to, to be updated on, on different ideas in the opening, uh, for example. The only question is, uh, as I mentioned, if he, if he finds time and energy to do something with it, or if it's more like, okay, this is interesting, I might, I might check this out later. But uh, mm. if he's actually able to do it, I don't know, but uh, for sure, uh, it's, it's, it's not a disadvantage to, to be following you know, the top players play every month. I think uh, the problem is that like when you're at this level that uh, David is on, you quite also have to do a lot of work to maintain it, right? Yeah. And uh, whether this is enough, I, like obviously I don't know, but uh, it can never be a disadvantage to actually look at chess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But also, like we saw him in the FIDA Grand Prix in Riga, yeah, he was right up there, and like yeah. okay, was this lost to Alireza in the final rounds? But if not, he might have even qualified to the candidates. Yeah, I mean it's, it's incredible, and and just goes to show that. Uh, when he's in form, I mean, he can compete with the best players in the world. And and same for Nils. And both have been over 2,700. Uh, and, uh, yeah, can basically beat any player on, on a good day, I would say. Um, so I understand that David is also playing quite a lot of Blitz, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think he, he enjoys playing Blitz, you know, a lot of Blitz online and uh, even Bullets sometimes. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, but but uh, again, does does he become a better chess player if he's playing a lot of blitz? I don't know. You become better at blitz. At you become better at blitz. That's true. <laughs> for for a match like this, I don't know if, if that's the best way to to prepare. But uh, no, but he gets in time trouble, and then at some point you reach this point where you have to make very quick decisions and still yeah. be able to calculate, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I think that's one of the advantages with being a good good blitz player, that's for sure. Yeah, and also by playing a lot of bullet, I think what is mainly trains is your uh, intuition. So I think it trains you in, in intuition and and to make decisions under time pressure and and to think fast. Uh, but also it's the element of luck and just playing just fast there with with the mouse, which also is not so beneficial. So. <laughs> It's like a mix, yeah, but it, I mean, it's certainly also plus sides to also playing in bullet. So. But I, I got a good advice the other day before you joined the broadcast uh, to Frederick. I was joined by uh, Mihailo Oleksenko, and he said that when you play bullet or blitz, you should always play with increment because ah. you never play a tournament game uh, where there's no increment, basically. So often I would win on time, you know, if I play three nil uh, blitz or one nil bullet. So uh, I'll I'll uh, definitely look into that. Yeah, no. Uh, all I can say is that I a hundred percent agree with him. I actually been came the Norwegian bullet champion, but that was only since it it was one plus one. Like yeah. I would have zero hopes of winning if, if it was one 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 plus zero. I would just get flagged and would be. But with this one one plus one, you're not getting flagged if you're fast and. Uh, then the po position actually, actually mattered. It was actually yeah. a lot of fun. So I fully I agree with him. I also played in that tournament, and I don't, I don't know, I finished seventh or eighth or something, but but I think I had would have had better chances without increment. Sure, so, yeah, sure, yeah. yes, yes. But that's how it is. <laughs> but I would definitely recommend for uh, like slightly weaker players, if you want to improve, like longer time controls, so like say 10 plus 5 or something, mm -hmm. 5 plus 5, something like this, it gives you a chance to to think a bit more, yeah. uh, which I think is better for the improvement than playing bullet, where it often becomes a bit random. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, I guess one of the benefits is, if, let's say you're trying to, to uh, play a new opening, uh, then you have so many more games, you know, because they're shorter. Uh, but again, it's difficult to to analyze, to calculate, and so on. But but uh, to get like the uh, the quantity, you know, the number of games, uh, shorter time control can be beneficial in that way. Uh, but I, overall, I agree with you. I think. Oh, wow! Good. And now, uh, wow, David has wow. has actually taken the pawn on e5 here. Interesting. That's so that uh, uh, makes another the game brave, another brave yeah. move, I would say. No, sure. He has he has been playing very bravely. Yeah, like he has been taking chances also with white. So now the game is definitely heating up. I think uh, this game will be super interesting. 
Yes, yes. Okay, so I I think uh, Nils, okay, he can't play rook e8 as it hangs on on f7, so I guess he should go knight takes e, e5 and also bishop takes e5. I guess rook e8 is the most natural move here just to put pressure on the bishop here on e5. And now it's a question for David, how, how he proceeds here. It's not an option to, to go queen takes e5 due to several reasons, but probably knight to d7 is the clearest. So then it makes me think that you either go f4 and try to keep your bishop here on e, e, e5, or you just take off the knight on f6. But then you also act, activate the opponent uh, queen here, yeah, needs his queen and has a lot of act activities. So maybe we should look at f4 here, maybe. Yeah, but again, too much. You know, the king is already in the center, and then you're moving the pawns in front of the king, and you still hasn't haven't developed this bishop on f1. It looks super scary, I would say. So, definitely. It's only if bishop takes f, f6 is like not good also. You, okay, at least I'm sure David is, is con considering, but yeah, and based on just looking at it, it feels too much. Uh, maybe here knight to g4, knight is fine maybe, but knight to g4 feels like the best move here. And now that... Yeah, I mean, this looks good for Nils. Um, but I have an idea just to, I mean, uh, from the white perspective, I'm, I'm happy with the draw. So yeah. I will probably just take on f6. Yes. And then I will give a pawn back uh, by playing f3. Or, or bishop okay. d3. f3 seems solid. And then you can take on b2, and then I'll play queen c3. Queen to c3, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then I, mm -hmm. every exchange, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. But if you have a good move here, that might be... Uh, yeah, so it seems good. to me here that rook to b8 is very Im important here. And yes, every ex exchange like pairs the, the defender, let's say, but, but if Nils is uh, finally... And, Entering with such an active rook on on the second rank, that that can lead to the initiative heavily being in his hands. Yeah. So maybe uh, in instead of f f three, maybe it makes more sense to to just yeah. say, okay, you can win a bit too, but just go bishop to e two yeah. uh, and castle as fast as you can. Could be absolutely, mm -hmm. and, and then I guess you can take on on uh, on b two. Yeah. Uh, Queen takes b2, maybe rook to b8 is a move also, but queen takes b2 feels like the most natural move here. The pieces are a bit loose, but maybe uh, white is just just in time. I'm not sure. Yeah, and then if you now take on a3, you can you can take on c, c5, right? Yeah, as it um, if now it takes takes and say queen takes, it might seem like you win the e4 pawn, but then there's bishop to f to f3 yeah. with a fork here, so this this does not really work out. Uh, so maybe black here should not take on a a3, but to make a waiting move here. Not sure which one is is the best one. Uh, maybe bishop to e6, making use that if if you move the queen, then it hangs on e2. Yeah. So probably this is something which David should go for. But okay, we will now figure out uh, now. Not takes e5, and bishop takes e5 is on the board, uh, and rook e8. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. But even this position we had before, I think there's still lots of play, right? We have extremely sure. a lot of uh, pieces and a couple of pawns, but uh, it's far from uh, a dead position. Let's yeah, say. Well, no, yes, yeah, true, true. And in some of those lines, I guess Nils will have this uh, pawn, a pawn, that can start running at some point. Yeah, that can also be like, like we can have this that Nils has, um, David rather, has an extra. Central pawn, but the A pawn could be very fast also. The past A, a pawn in, in the lines would be very discussing with bishop takes f6 and bishop to e2. Uh, so game is very interesting, but it seems to me that bishop takes f6 is more or less the only move here for David. Doesn't seem like anything else. But by now it's quite clear that it's David who is slightly worse and, and is trying to hold here. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you. And I uh, just want to mention Steven uh, from the chat saying uh, some top level chess being played in this this one. Both players has brought their A game, uh, in my opinion. And yeah, I completely agree with that. And um, he's also weighing in on whether whether uh, 
commentating on these top games uh, has been beneficial for David. And he's saying his commentating might have helped his prep, but being in the game on the clock in the moment is never going to be the same. And uh, yeah, that's of course uh, a very good point. And uh, um, and yeah, uh, I think. But as we mentioned, just um, kind of being uh, up to date on on some opening ideas. I think that's the main uh, benefit of working closely, you know, on the Champions Chess Tour. And and also, I mean, he's analyzing the games as as we go. Uh, so uh, I think it's difficult to kind of pinpoint what concretely what uh, what benefits he gets, but I just feel that. Um, it can't be a bad thing, at least for David. Mm. So, um, um, and uh, while, yeah, David might have uh, have a long think here. Uh, they've been playing for a bit over two hours. I think we, we will have another uh, short break and we'll be back uh, in a few, a few minutes. So stay tuned. The position is uh, definitely heating up. So uh, we'll be back shortly. up my rocker but follow me i'm ahead of the game i'm ahead of the game well, i'm only ever slinging i'm working over time got the song and i'm the singer the melody the vibe i'm a prodigy logically i'm impossibly wanted then they'll remember my name they'll remember my name well i'm ahead i'm ahead of the game i'm ahead of the game I moved away from the city 13 years ago. I worked as a journalist, I studied in university, but there was a sense of longing towards something a bit more real where I could actually create things and, and uh, be much closer to nature. I'm a vegan farmer. That's a bit unusual, but uh, that's what I am. It's a long story. I used to be one of those people that thought that veganism is impossible, very deeply entrenched in, in like the small scale uh, animal farming uh, community. You know, I was a leading proponent for keeping pigs and, and doing animal husbandry, but with a human uh, touch. Well, as our business grew, our farm expanded and our shop started selling more and more meat and eggs and milk. It felt less as I was doing something good for the animals and more and more as I was just showing a happy face for uh, any kind of animal product consumption. It felt like I was a poster boy for, for the animal industry in itself. So I, I, uh, that didn't feel so good, to be honest. So we're picking for the bags and it's 15 bags that makes uh, about three kilos, just a little bit extra to be sure. I came across veganism on YouTube actually and um, a lot of the things they were saying started to make a lot of sense. The first year or so was really difficult. I made a lot of enemies, unfortunately, because most of my friends were also farmers with animals on their farm. And when I started posting on Facebook that I was a vegan and I was against killing animals and all that stuff, and that wasn't too popular with my farmer friends. <laughs> there were just so many questions also that we had to answer 
or what are you going to eat instead? It's not easy to make a dietary change, but it's even more difficult to make a change in a farm. Our whole infrastructure, everything we had on the farm, was based around animals. We sold the animals, uh, took down all the fencing, we tore down the animal houses. Uh, and uh, if you don't have animals, you still have to uh, produce something on your farm, obviously. And we put a lot of effort into growing different beans and legumes. There's enormous potential in switching from animal uh, agriculture into vegan agriculture, purely from an efficiency uh, viewpoint. You know, if you grow one hectare of beans and uh, compare that to one hectare of uh, grass for sheep, you will find that the beans produce, I think it's up to 10 times as many calories on the same amount of land. Animals aren't a very efficient way often to produce food, you know. You, your food kind of takes a, an extra way through the animal, you know. You grow grains, you give them to the animal, and then you eat the animal, you lose a lot on the way. Instead, if you grow grains and make that into a product that's eaten directly by humans, you know, you're just taking a shortcut and, and being more efficient also. We're approaching nine billion people here on the planet. We need to be more efficient with the land we already have. And I think yeah, going into vegan farming, that will be one of the most important steps we can take. I still have friends who have animals. Uh, I don't mind that. There's many places that are not suitable for vegan farming. You can only grow grass there. This is one of them. It's a beautiful place. There's no one model that fits everybody. Uh, different farms have different uh, possibilities and you have to adapt to the way your farm is. And uh, this is uh, yeah, a beautiful place where animals graze. Uh, I like that also. But there should be alternatives. <laughs> We're not bound by tradition anymore. You can just, instead of doing like your parents or your neighbors do, Google your way and just find, uh, you know, some guy in New Zealand is doing a thing and copy that guy instead. Welcome back. Uh, this is the final game of the special challenge match between David Howell and Nils Brandelius, uh, playing in the heart of London at the Swedish Embassy. Uh, David is leading 5-4, to four, uh, which means uh, this is a must-win game for Nils with the black pieces. 
and uh, we were a little bit optimistic uh, on his behalf uh, to Frederick. Uh, he, he found some interesting ideas in this uh, uh, Grunfeld opening and uh, sacrificed a pawn now uh, just before the break. And um, it seems like uh, David is contemplating uh, going into one of the lines which we analyzed, uh, possibly giving back the pawn uh, to get this king into safety and uh, just trying to stab uh, stabilize the, mm. the position a bit. Yes. So, um, like a few moments ago, Nils played this very uh, exciting e5 move. Here, uh, David had had many options, uh, shows as bishop to e3 or bishop to g3, but he de decided to to go matrix e, e e5, and uh, I think the advantage for David ha having played here matrix e e5 is that okay the the position is uh, fine, but it's a bit more simplified, let's say, so it's a bit more hard to to go wrong, and and, and the position is maybe not as complicated. That that being said, I. I think here uh, Nils has uh, a slightly better position here, uh, and later may maybe can win this a a three pawn, and we could get a race with the a pawn here for the back side. Uh, so it's definitely a lot of play left, and I think uh, Nils is slightly better than pressing. Um, but okay, if if David defends very well, then the game is most likely going to be a draw. Um, but uh, still. I'm sure that David will, uh, Nils will put some pressure on David here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very interesting position. And uh, I just want to remind everyone, uh, we're doing a fundraiser, a uh, joint effort between Chess24 and the Norwegian Refugee Council, uh, raising money for uh, the victims of the war in Ukraine. Uh, it's a great cause. We're approaching ten thousand dollars it would be fantastic if we can uh, cross that mark uh after today's game currently we are at nine thousand eight hundred and twenty nine dollars so only two two hundred dollars uh to go to to get that ten thousand which would be amazing so if you have the chance uh, please do donate and help us supporting this great cause and there's a qr code on the broadcast, and we'll also try and, and post a link uh, to the donation site, which uh, should be straight, quite straightforward. And uh, we also all know how to use these uh, QR codes, I expect, after the, the pandemic. So <laughs> just put your smartphone, um, put the camera on, and uh, should be should be simple. And we have a move. Yeah, so here Nils placed the developing move. Uh, bishop to e6 as uh, we have mentioned before like when we were analyzing this game it might seem like nils wins a pawn here with with, with queen takes a a3 but after after queen takes c5 uh, here queen takes c5 rook takes c5 nils cannot take the pawn on e4 due to bishop to f3 and, and you are losing the ex exchange uh, with a losing po position so that is why nils did not take on a a a three. If it's better for this, probably he would have taken it this pawn. But he rather just de develops his uh, Russian bishop pair to 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 e six. And uh, here white cannot take on c five, as then queen takes e two would lose a piece. So white now has to decide if if to play queen to a six or queen to d d three. And it feels much more natural for me to go queen to a6. If if you have go queen to d3, you are uh, stepping into all kinds of rook to d8s, maybe, maybe c4 with, with, with a tempo. So it feels to me that queen to a6 is a much more safe move and it's what David probably is going to play here. So, um, but the pieces of Nils uh, is, is there standing quite well. The, Question is if this c5 pawn, which is isolated, is it a weakness or is it a strength? And um, I mean, it could turn out to be both. It depends on the act activity of the pieces of Nils. Uh, like if, if Nils gets passive, then the c5 pawn could be weak. But if he manages to make use of his um, good pieces, then it could also be a strength. So here after queen to a6, he has to find a way to play. One possible way could here to go queen to b6, 
with the point that in case white takes then we take back with with the a pawn with very very big pressure on the a a three pawn we could think about doubling on the a file putting some pressure um so okay to be b6 is a move uh and different move could be just to de develop a rook to c8 maybe could also be a move so yeah I think it makes sense to 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 keep the a pawn for for David because I think uh, Nils's a pawn uh, is a stronger uh, pass pawn uh, potentially than the c pawn. Mm. That also has to do with the uh, uh, Black's uh, light squared bishop on e6. Uh, if you, in a dream scenario, can get the, the pawn all the way to to a2, uh, it's it's quite uh, annoying, right? Um, while the c pawn is not so easy to defend for. Uh, for Nils with the bishop in the current position, right, and uh, David's bishop on e2 um, has covered the, the c4 square, and uh, yeah, I think this makes a lot of sense uh, from from David's perspective to to, to keep his a pawn. And um, I was also looking into if you play queen b6 um, with with black, can you contemplate just going a4? A a4 with the idea to go a. Yeah. Five, yeah, and also you have possibly you can also in at some point maybe you just put your bishop on, on b5 and then try to double the rooks on the c file and, and try and get some pressure. This could definitely be an idea. Uh, in case of a, a4, I guess here black has to find a good waiting move uh, as to anticipate a, a5 coming. Um, I'm not sure what is the most precise way here. Um, you, you could do something like rook to d8 and after a5. Uh, just say that you lost some time and going queen to c7, defending this pawn and maybe going rook to d4. But uh, it's not, not so easy maybe for, for black. So I like this I, idea. Bishop to b5 could also be an option here. Uh, but still, uh, rook e d8 seems quite nice and Either rook to d2 and rook to d4 is is coming. I think it's all about just getting the best coordination of your pieces here. That is the trick, and um, maybe something like rook to c to c2 maybe to double the rooks on the c file could be an option here. Yeah. I I think the only thing which David should really avoid is losing the a3 pawn and getting to to his races with the past a pawn. If he can, uh, I. I well, that then I, then I think it's quite likely that the game is going to beat it out to a draw and David wins the match. So, but um, here Nils has to find a way. It could also be an idea here for uh, White to play bishop to c4 to just say that my bishop on e2 is a bit, it's not the best piece for, for the moment. So maybe I, I can ex exchange it up for a bishop on e6. And if we imagine that these two bishops get traded off, sure, black has some in initiative with a bit more active pieces, but it really shouldn't be something very special also, it, it feels like. So, yeah. But I like what David has, has done. I think from a practical point of view, uh, it actually makes a lot of sense to go into, into a position like this. He has to be quite ac accurate the next moves. But if he manages, um, I think um, he has good chances here to hold that draw. And um, yeah, I, have to, I mean, I have to give you David some credit because it, it's not the first game in the match where he's been, you know, slightly worse. And then when you think, okay, now Nils has a has a good chance to to capitalize, and and then David somehow finds all these good moves to to stabilize the position and to neutralize uh, Nils's in, initiative, and. Um, I get a feeling that he's he's achieving that one once again. And uh, if you, if if we think about you know the position a few moves ago, uh, I think we all agreed that yeah, Nils was doing really good. And and now it, I get the feeling that uh, yeah, David has maybe maybe overcome uh, like the worst uh, pressure sure. in the position. Yeah, like it, the character of the position has changed very much. Certainly, it's not so much about plans and trying to understand. Okay, sure, it's still plans, but now it's much more concrete. Either what you think works or or it doesn't. Uh, but yes, it's a very important point 
and I think modern players are really strong at the defending in general. I I think maybe that's what separates the GMs from from today than than before. It, is that before if if you got on, under pressure they were more fast crumbling, but now you really have to beat the modern grammars in in the opening in the middle game and and in the end game. Um, so, but Nils plays the queen to be b b six move, which I like quite much. So Nils definitely haven't given up winning this uh, game yet. It's a good good uh, good move, and obviously he, he dreams of uh, David taking the queen. Yes. Just to get this uh, pressure, and then his uh, C5 uh, bond would not be weak. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I like your idea also, just to try and maybe now uh, double the rooks in the. Yeah, C5. rook to C2 feels like a good I idea here also. And uh, and once once you get um, get the rooks into the game, you feel like white white has achieved uh, a little bit. Yes, but, but at the same time, maybe here it's very smart for Black to play something like Rook E E C eight to keep an eye off the A pawn with this Rook and say after Rook F C eight to to go uh, Rook to C six with mm. with uh, putting some more pressure on on his queen. And if you take, you of course take with the pawn. And like a position like this should be very nice for for um, Nils here. So probably after after, after Rook to C six, uh, White should not. Take on B B six. He should probably move his queen away. Um, we can move like maybe queen to B five or even queen to D D three. Though queen to D three feels a bit unnatural. Maybe give C four. So I think queen to B B B five is probably the move. And the position remains quite tense. Um, but all like I think this queen to B six was anyway a very good inclusion here of Nils, keeping some tension there. That's Absolutely. mainly what what you just need is tension that the position is in too much simplified. So, yeah. Well, but but I think here that David is here going to have a small think to to understand what is the most effective uh, defensive setup here. Since yes, I mean it makes sense to uh, double on 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 the C file, but if this queen stands here on b6 and, and sees this rook to c8, rook to c6, maybe it won't be so obvious to him that this is best and, and he will try something else. So, but also when, when you have many options, you can also go wrong. But, um, but, but uh, during this match, he has been de defending quite well. So I'm sure he has seen worse. Yeah, yeah. And, um, than, than this. So. I think, I mean, he also realizes if, if if he can get uh, the rooks now uh, well placed, um, the queen is being defended by the bishop. So, um, yeah, it's it's a bit difficult to see how how Nils can keep up uh, adding pressure, but but uh, it's it's definitely not over. And uh, you showed us some some ideas um, bringing Black's rook into the game as well, and uh, and trying to 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 put David to the test. Um, yes, and I actually think your your a a four move is actually quite human move. Like to not uh, allow rook to c eight, rook to c six as you're not in time. So a four is definitely something um, David here would be con considering. The only minus with this move is that he's losing some time, and mm -hmm. maybe uh, Nils has a way of using this time into his ad ad advantage here in the uh, best way. Yeah. Uh, so. Definitely not, not an easy position. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, we are following uh, the chat. So if you have any questions or uh, move move suggestions, we will uh, answer as best we can. This might be another long game, so uh, it's always good to get some input from, uh, from the viewers. Definitely. <laughs> but it's about the defending worst po positions it's quite a hard topic to like improve on like it's hard to like uh, have a clear way of getting better at this i think i heard someone say that you just have to calculate well yeah, and and to feel where to put the pieces but mm -hmm. already something that 
that you learn by just ex- experience and being put to the test by strong pl- players, since they are going to ask those hard questions. So, um, yeah. And I guess, I mean, it makes sense for David now to have a think, um, not, o- not only considering his, his next move, but but to, to, to get a good understanding of the position and also uh, maybe, you know, what type of setup he wants to, to have uh, going forward in this yes. game. And also like this, this kind of position, it's not the same as, as we had in the game where Nils won, where it's like a clear mating attack. Here you, you, you can uh, allow having a bit lesser time as it's not as critical as in some other four positions. But he now plays Rook to be B1. Probably he was scared of the ideas of like uh, Nils forcing uh, Quintex B, B6. So here, I, I think David would be quite happy if Nils now plays Quint to A6, Bishop takes A, A6. And then it's quite far off that we are going to get this kind of end, end game with the past A, A pawn. Yeah. So I think that's uh, David. I idea with book to be one. Yeah, looks like a very decent move, and and now you can also bring the other rook to c one afterward. Yeah. Um, to c one here, and both the rooks are quite nice there playing. So um, seems like quite a nice move here for me. Just trying to keep the tension is here to go queen to c seven. Uh, and making use that suddenly the queen maybe can swing to f4 and try for some di- dynamics this this way. Mm-hmm. So this is like quite fascinating how a seemingly easy position like this still has a lot of nuances. Yeah, and, and it's easy to to go wrong for both sides. Uh, so I ex- expect a queen to see seven from Mills. This is the move which keeps the most tension. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, if, if Nils takes on a6, he's kind of saying, okay, uh, let's make a draw. Uh, yeah, yes. Like, Queen takes a, a6 would lose a lot of the tension. Ah, but he takes on a6. Okay. Wow. Okay. I'm yeah. a bit bit surprised. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, as we said, I just felt David really played well uh, last few moves and managed to overcome some of the difficulties in the position. And and uh, after giving the pawn back, uh, getting the king to safety, maybe maybe Nils just realized, okay, yeah, there's there's nothing much left to do. Yes, uh, sure. And I mean, it's also slightly risky, like playing queen to c7 and uh, allowing white to have the open b file. So yeah. I mean, it's it it makes sense also to take on a a6. And possibly you know yeah, rook b b7 could come in some uh, if you play queen c7. Yes. You have to calculate that. Um, maybe also Nils' idea here is after bishop takes a6 to here go rook to b8 and maybe still have the same idea of rook to b6 trying to be a bit annoying. But it yeah. feels like it's not the same uh, power in this idea as it was a few moves ago, maybe. Not not sure. I I think David should not have any problems holding this pool position by this point yeah uh, I agree with you should be um, should be doable for him and uh, all right we have a question uh, from uh, gold Rifan uh, saying hi do you think uh, a human can beat a supercomputer uh, well the I I think not in general uh, if it it was possible maybe not sure how many years ago, maybe ten or fifteen years years ago, we we still had a chance when when the engines uh, still had some clear weak, weaknesses, like they didn't understand fully some positional concepts. But nowadays, the engine is both like it's calculating at a speed which is like impossible to understand, and also it has uh, like po- positional un- understanding, uh, like this new uh, Lila line. Uh, Alpha Zero and also the stockfishes, like they are really strong in 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 the positional chess. So I I I feel like the race be, 
between humans and computers have sort of like this gone. We at this point we just have to learn from them, not really beat them. It's mm-hmm. very hard. Um, but but also having the computers nowadays it is a great tool for a player to also learn a, a lot. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's now twenty five years ago since Kasparov lost against Deep Blue. So yeah. it just goes to show how. Uh, yeah, how good you can just imagine how good they've become ever since you know in the last yeah, yeah. years compared to to when that match was played. And as you said, yeah, just use them as uh, useful tools rather than look at them, you know, like opponents or uh, a threat. Yes. Right? Also, I uh, have a difficulty playing against the computer since it's not a human. Yeah, so you feel like you can't trick him whatever trick yeah. you're doing they're just going to re, re, refute it and a lot of the human el- element is simply lost that like you want to beat your or, or, or opponent and so on with a computer like at some point i think it's very hard for a human to just keep playing it's no matter what you do you think you're going to lose so yeah, yeah. absolutely and um i go saying the queen on a6 was uh, surprisingly strong in this position i was mm. analyzing how to remove it from a6 f1 diagonal and was unsuccessful. Mm. So maybe, yeah, maybe Nils also realized that uh, that uh, yeah, White was doing quite well. And yeah, uh, so it's ah, but but okay now after Rook to B8, uh, David here played Rook to C C1, and now we actually might see the scenario that that we talked about here with Rook to B B3 winning the A pawn. Uh, for the c5 pawn and maybe the a pawn could be a, a strong pawn maybe yeah. so okay i would give slight preference still to nils in this end game uh, so maybe david had some all the way to avoid this I, I, I agree with you i think that's the only realistic chance nils has to win this game is if black can take the a pawn and the uh, white takes the c5 pawn and um Maybe, maybe this a a pawn uh, for black can uh, can become strong and uh, yeah. possibly win the game. Uh, but at the same time, David seems quite active also, so yeah. it's uh, hard to say. So it could also ju- just just be a draw. So it depends a bit move move by move, yeah. Um, but it's just fe- I, I, it feels uh, difficult to see any other winning plans. For, yeah, or exactly. for for black in this position. Yes. And uh, David on the chat saying, what's the score so far? So David is leading five to four after nine games. This is the last and final game. Uh, David would be happy uh, to make a draw and, and win this match. And uh, yeah, Kevin has, has also a very good question. Uh, David spent three minutes before taking on A6. Why don't he just take immediately? Uh, it's such a... It's it's, ah. it's a new move, you know. Um, so what what's the explanation behind that? Do you think? Yeah. So my best guess is that he was maybe at the bottom, maybe or not present at the board. Uh, like you could here try to guess what is Black's move and not take on a six right away. But generally speaking, you're anyway going to take on a six no matter how much you think. So I think the rational thing to do is is to just take back right away if you're sure what your move is. Uh, so my best guess is that he was just not present at, at the board or were walking around, yes. Um, so yeah. But yeah, it's a, like it's a bit strange like if you not make the only move in the position right away. Yeah, because of course you, you can then start to think about the position after you take on a6 and yeah. so on. But, but uh, it feels like um, you're not risking anything by just taking immediately because uh, if your opponent then starts thinking, you can spend some of his time on the clock to then yeah. uh, think about your next move. So, uh, yeah, if there's only one move in the position, just play it uh, yeah. instantly, and then you start thinking. I think that's a good good advice. Yeah. So I also have, have this rule that I try to not think for more than 15 minutes for a move, and this kind mm-hmm. of things. It's like good to have these rules to avoid getting in time trouble. So Yeah, absolutely. And 
And if, if, if the position had been a bit more complicated, uh, we could potentially see uh, some time trouble in this game. But I think, uh, I mean, they have 20 minutes for uh, plus increment uh, for the next 19 moves. So I don't think time will be a, be a big problem in, in this game. Mm, no. Should be fine here. Um, so now I, I think um, after Rook to C1, uh, Nils is now thinking if he should go rook to b to b3, winning the a pawn, or if he has some other way of trying to keep a bit more tension, maybe. Uh, like if it is just a, a, a another way, but I think most likely he's going to go rook to b3 and go for his position with the past a pawn. But maybe, maybe then David can play, instead of taking on c5, maybe play a4 after rook b3. Yeah, it's possible. It's a possibility. Maybe then... Um, uh, and then the idea well, is it after rook b4, you just take on c5 and you give away the e4 pawn. Uh, ah, uh, but... Okay, uh, but maybe you... Okay, let's see. Yeah, and, we should, and here yeah. rook to a, a, a5, yeah? Yeah, that's the, that's the only trick. Um, that's a really cool trick. Yeah. But maybe, maybe with without uh, both of the rooks, the eight pawn isn't that strong. It's hard to say. Uh, maybe it's even stronger. I'm not sure. It's yeah. hard to say these these things since if you're forced to defend against this pawn with your only active rook, it could also not be so good. Also, uh, so it's hard to say these things. Yeah. So yeah, rook a five is a good good move. Yeah, but maybe uh, some other. Uh, a4, look to be four. I mean, you, okay, you could you also know, go a5, yeah? Yeah. That looks a5. like a good move. Yeah. Now, obviously, rook a4 doesn't work because of bishop uh, b5. Um, so, yeah, a5 yeah. is in play. Um, yeah, a5 is a move. So, a possibility. The only worry would be if this pawn could potentially be a weakness, maybe. But uh, for the moment, it seems fine for um, white here. And now in this position, it seems like you either have to take on, on e4 or play c4. Yeah. And c4 doesn't look... It looks a bit strange. Yeah. Like, it feels like this pawn is not so strong at, at the moment with all of white pieces being so active. And sure, you, you can go rook a4 and take then attack on c4. Yeah, so but I that think... Bishop b5 trick. So, uh... Yeah. <laughs> but here maybe maybe you can just double the rooks, you know, rook c2 and then rook c1. Yeah, yes. Or maybe rook to d1 also, maybe, and then yeah. rook to d4. Rook, yeah. So this looks yeah. pretty good for white. Or yeah, should, should be fine. So um, yeah, so it's not easy to see. Uh, I mean black can obviously try and play rook b3, but it might be too little. I mean, to yeah. Try. And also, like if I move rook to b b6. I, I think David's idea is just to go bishop to c4. And as they say, like all rook and games are drawn. Okay, not all, but I think this one is uh, in quite a big margin for David. It shouldn't really be any problem here. Uh, for, for him, it should just be equal. So I ex expect Nils to go rook to b3 here. And uh, meanwhile, we have, uh, uh, yeah, so rook, rook b3 is played. Um, and I guess, yeah, we're expecting maybe A4. And uh, meanwhile, uh, we have a question from uh, from uh, Jelly Monster. Who are Sweden's and England's second highest rated players? Um, so Nils is uh, Sweden's number one player and has been for many years uh, in England. Um, I still think it's uh, Michael Adams, who is uh, number one on rating. And they have many strong players. You know, they have uh, Gawain Jones. They have Luke McShane, uh, mm. Nigel Short. So I think all of them are quite similar. Uh, they have similar rating at the moment. So yeah. right behind Michael Adams, you know, there are three, four players around 26, uh, 60, 70 um, on the rating list. But uh, do you know uh, which uh, Swedish player? Um, yeah, so in Sweden... They have quite a few grand marches on 2500, but as far as I know, probably number two after this is Yevgeny Agrest, is my best yeah. guess. Yeah, is he I around 2600 or yeah, yeah, he at least was. Um, I'm not sure now, but 
Probably he is number two. And I also guess. Emmanuel Berg was close to 2600. Ah. Yes, so they have, uh, might be high rated. Yeah, that's yeah yes. So it's um, Emmanuel Berg and Tiger Hillard. Yeah. But I think I'm going to list this highest. I could be wrong, but I think so. Um, yeah. I mean, are there any other moves to consider for David? I mean, I think we, we didn't like. To take on C5 just to give Nils this option of of getting the, mm. the pass the A pawn. Okay. Um, One thing we, which I'm sure he's not going to, to do is he's here to go rook to A1. As as he has just played rook to C1, it makes no sense to now go rook to A1. So my feeling is is that as he has played rook to C1, it makes sense to just take on C5 and say, yes, the A pawn is a past pawn. I must be dangerous, but it should also be hold. Holdable. I think that is what is most likely going to do. Yeah. A, with with consideration of of A four also. No. But uh, that's a very good point. I mean, especially in end games, uh, you need to be active, right? Yes. Play a move like rook a one just doesn't make any sense because then your rook is tied up um, to defend on that square, and you allow your opponent to infiltrate. Uh, and and in this case, you know, dangerous palm as well. Yeah, uh, but it's all about activity. So definitely, even in some cases, you sacrifice a pawn to get uh, the rooks into the position to the seventh rank, for example. Um, yeah. So in general, don't don't uh, defend uh, passively. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. and that's also like one of the dangers, let's say, of having weak pawns in in the end game is is that you often can be forced back on the de de defensive, trying to defend these pawns. So it's not uh, always the weak pawn that kills you. It's often just the passive pieces resolving for this uh, passive pawn or this weak pawn, yeah? So yeah, the ac activity in the endgame is very Im important. Uh, so here, rook to a1, for sure, not something he, he would do here. Yeah. <clears throat> Mm. But that, I guess it makes sense to like think a bit here, since if you here make something sub -op optimal, let's say you're gonna really regret it for a long time if you end up having a slightly worse endgame. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So maybe he's calculating then what happens after. After uh, rook takes c5, rook takes a3. Mm. Uh, the bishop is attacked by the rook on, on a3. Yes. But then Probably. maybe not bishop bishop uh, c4 doesn't work, I guess, because of rook c3. Yeah, I think that's a quite in, in important motive. So here, uh, this bishop actually makes this pass one quite, a, quite strong. So... I think it is in White's interest to exchange off these bishops heading to a rook end, end game where, sure, the pass pawn is dangerous, but then you can place a rook behind it and you always have play. Uh, but here, bishop to c4 fails due to rook to c3. Or, okay, you, you have still bishop to b5, but I think this is quite good for, for black with a5 coming. And the pieces here are quite active for black. So uh, David here should probably... Here, find another way of playing. Maybe quite strong here is bishop to b7 with the idea bishop to d5 at, at the moment, um, which uh, should be quite fine for him, uh, I think. But it could be a, a bit un unpleasant in, in this position when you realize that bishop to c4 does not really work. Mm -hmm. So that could, uh, like, if you don't see the final move of the variation, it could be discourage you from not playing rook takes c5. So maybe he's he's also looking at a a4 here, which makes sense to avoid this kind of positions. Yeah, for, for some reason, I, I prefer a4, but um, yeah, just to not allow black to, to get this a pawn. Yeah, no, at least in, in some end games, if we reach this a, a pawn, the position is a lot more critical. In the sense that if you just wait around for a few moves and the pass pawn gets to a4 or a3, suddenly the position can easily just 
we lost. So you are sort of in a more safe zone if you play a4. Um, but but I think if uh, David finds rook takes e5 and bishop to b7, I uh, think he's favorite to hold this game. Yeah. So the current position is with the, the pawn on a3. Yeah. Um, David to play. Um, and meanwhile, we have a couple of questions. Uh, Kevin uh, asking how many moves have uh, been played? Uh, how many moves until the time control? So yeah, it has been 23 moves have been played so far. Or, yeah, 23 moves have been played. So now it's white to play. So yeah, 17 moves until the time control. But as we mentioned, we don't su suspect that this will be a big uh, uh, difficulty in in the time trouble because the situation, the position is is um, not too complicated, I would say. Mm. And um, Ed saying, "Good to see some young analysis." Is Tor a full time chess player? Thank you. Uh, yes, for the moment, I'm a chess pro. Professional, so I'm taking a gap year, maybe uh, two years, yeah. But uh, for the moment, I'm playing chess and trying to Im improve. Yeah. So the big goal is to become a grandmaster, obviously. Uh, yeah. Yes. And as we mentioned, your rating is now up to twenty-four sixty-five. So yeah, it's now this um, approaching the magical twenty-five hundred mark. Yeah, it will be a dream for a long time to become a grandmaster. So. Would be very nice. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Jello Monster. I didn't realize Nigel Short was still playing competitively. Um, I don't think he's a very active player, but he do still play some tournaments here and there. Um, I think he yes. played a tournament in um, Italy or yeah. yeah, Italy recently. So yeah, from time to time, still playing. A few times you can also see him on. Chess.com, if you play there, he's active there also. So. Yeah. Once a chess player, always a chess player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's like really with chess, it's a hobby for a lifetime. Like once you are addicted, there is no way out. Yeah. <laughs> as, as they say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, okay, David is still thinking. Eight minute thing so far. Mm. Um, but it's also, as you said, it's good to just double check. Um, because even though the, the, the position is quite equal, uh, I still think black is the one that can create some chances. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so to be precise here uh, is important for David, just not to fall into some, some uh, tricks or uh, yeah, yeah. allowing Nils to, to create some... Uh, some advantage. Yes. Like just from, a, from a practical point of view, I would prefer just to play A4 and yeah. then tell Nils, okay, how are you going to make any progress in this position? Mm. Yeah, I also think F A4 is quite a good solution here also. It's also what I learned while watching this World Championship match be between Magnus and uh, Pomnacci is that when Magnus has a winning position, he's really thinking for quite some time. Yeah. And it, it, it is like you're, you're uh, using time now to save time later. So if you do the hard work while you're winning, you might save time in the, like in, in the long term. Like imagine if you're winning and, and you play fast, maybe not the most op optimal, then suddenly it's a lot more work and so on. And maybe it works the, it works the same way if you're uh, like a bit okay, not much worse, but slightly worse. If you put in the work, it's a it's a like the drawing margin is a lot bigger. Then mm -hmm. if you suddenly make a, some some mistakes, then suddenly you have to be precise, and that's never so easy. So I think just using time makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and while David is thinking, uh, maybe we should have. Uh... A really short break before we uh, come to the conclusion of this final game uh, of this match. Uh, David is still thinking uh, in this position and uh, we'll be back uh, very shortly. So stay tuned. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here and we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the you know, his non-chess team. So I see some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand and we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you again about the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind the scenes insights. <laughs> See you then. Welcome back. Uh, it looks like David has uh, found uh, a good good move in this position to to uh, liquidate some of the pressure he was under. This is the final game uh, of a 10, 10 game match uh, between David Howell and Nils Brandelius being played here in the heart of London uh, at the Swedish Embassy. And uh, David is quite happy because he's leading the match five to four 
which means a draw for him today with the white pieces uh, is a great result and will secure him the the, the, the win in this match. And uh, do you see any chances at all now for, for Nils uh, to win? Yeah, so uh, we have this position here uh, when in this position before he played uh, bishop to b7 where black has a passed uh, pawn here on the the a file so if this pawn can be pushed forward and nils could potentially have some winning chances but here uh, david found a very nice move bishop to b7 intending to go bishop to, to d5 uh, exchanging off these bishops and i think once the bishops are exchanged off the strength of of the past a pawn um, goes down significantly and i i feel like the verse is over for david and he shouldn't have any problems holding this game any, anymore but it was quite important here to go bishop to b7 and not run the with bishop to c4 because of rook to c3 with a pin uh, white could still go bishop to b5 but this would give black an edge uh, but bishop to b7 seems like a very precise way to play um so i do not think that Nils' winning chances here are so high. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, after bishop b7, it looks like David is in control at least, at least in terms of, of making a draw, Yeah, which would be a good result for him. And uh, yeah, this idea of just trading off the bishops seems like, uh, from a practical point of view, uh, like a very good plan. Um, and it's hard to see that, yeah, this a pawn can become a big, big threat. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Like once uh, White ex exchanges off these bishops, let create some loot for his king to not get back fragmented, activates his last rook. Um, okay, I would still choose black slightly, as I don't think there is any way black can be worse. But um, also, it's not really something special. So here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, as uh, Jordi JJ saying on the chat, David wins by securing uh, a draw today. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, we've had the two wins in this match for David, one for Nils, and uh, the rest of the games have been uh, draws. Although some very fighting and exciting draws, that has to be said. Uh, especially in game one, uh, Nils had a great position with the white pieces, and uh, the computer loved his position, uh, but David... Uh, managed to fight back and uh, save a draw in that game. And also in other other games that have been drawn, uh, White has been uh, pushing uh, in most of those games. And uh, uh, yeah, the players might be a bit, uh, you know, uh, kicking themselves for not taking advantage of some of the good positions they've had. But we also have to give them credit because they've been uh, defending very well and also finding... Uh, good uh, defensive resources when put under pressure. So, uh, yeah, it's been a very, really well played match and uh, some, uh, yeah, some quality chess, I would say. For sure. Yes. And I think David has shown his uh, qualities as a player, but especially as a defender also. So he has been under some pressure, but have been very good at the, the, the defending. And even if Nils has, has been better, it doesn't mean that the point is. Uh, there, yeah. So you always have to win those better positions, but it's not easy uh, uh, against tough resistance. Yeah. And uh, we have a question from Todd. Todd Smith, are you working on getting a title like uh, International Master Oskin? No, I think my my uh, playing days are uh, close to over. So now I'm working on the Champions Chess Store uh, with David. And uh, yeah, doing uh, chess-related work, uh, but not not as a player. So um, I used to play a lot when I was younger, and uh, probably was a talent of some sorts uh, many years ago. But now I just enjoy watching chess and working with chess, and uh, and not play as much myself. But uh, yeah, do still play a little bit, you know, online and one tournament here and there but uh, yeah i don't have any big ambitions on uh, getting any titles at least but it's still fun just playing yeah so yeah, yeah. absolutely and uh, i mean we've mentioned this uh, chess bar in in oslo quite a few times the good night i love going there having a drink meet up with friends playing some uh, some blitz and uh, yeah 
just enjoying chess in, in a different way, I guess, than, than I used to do when I was younger mm. and traveling a lot and playing tournaments and, and so on. Um, we do have a question. I don't have the live stream at the moment. Ah, let me see the video feed of the players. Um, Jelly Monster was asking um, who are the two players in the background? And I assume uh, either uh, some people uh, working at the embassy or possibly one of them can be the arbiter um, for this match. Uh, didn't get the chance to to see them. Um, but there are there is uh, an arbiter for the match. Um, FIDE, Arbiter, and uh, obviously there are some people uh, from the embassy. Uh, and there will be a reception for the players after the game. So uh, we might not be able to get the players, uh, unfortunately, today, but um, mm. we'll see what uh, what we can do. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and maybe even in this position you can play Bishop, um, bishop yeah. or... so here uh, Nils plays rook to d8, which uh, has the point of like this encouraging white of playing rook um, bishop to d5. The point is is that after bishop takes d5, if you hear say go pawn takes d5, then black is going to go rook to d3, and say and after rook to a1 for for example, uh, say rook takes d5, rook takes, you are not in time to take the a7 pawn as your back rank is falling. And here, black would would be winning probably. So yep. the point that is is that you're not in time to take the a pawn. But uh, here, Nils um, Dale rather has a really good resource. And if if he finds this, I think the game is soon going going to to be over. And that's here to go rook to d1, pinning the. Ah, um, oh, that's a that's a great move. Yes, and uh, now you 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 can take back on d5 without having to worry about the. Uh, Back rank for for the moment, and I think a position where you take with the pawn, the d pawn is not much weaker than than the a pawn. It should just just be a draw. So, yeah, so uh, suddenly black has to be careful with the with the d pawn running. But I guess you can bring yes. the king, king over. But uh, yeah, it looks very drawish. Yeah, I mean by this point, white is not worse. So, but also it shows that you know having a lift for the king in some positions is is quite important. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, uh, with the pawn on h6, uh, Nils uh, achieved that earlier in the game. Um, and I guess, I mean, I've lost uh, when I was younger, started playing chess. I have lost to back, back rank mates, you know, and it's it's always a terrible feeling. So uh, a general <laughs> advice would be to, to move, you know, h3 uh, uh, in some positions at least, or g3, um, just to get some extra squares for the king. Uh, which is quite uh, useful, especially in the in the end game. Yeah. So it, it can become a route for the king to to become active, you know, later on in the game. Um, especially if you play g6 or g3, you can go up up, uh, yes. up to the center of the board. But, but I think yeah. uh, rook to d8 is quite a good practical try. Um, okay, if David finds, but it's not so. Okay, he's very capable of finding it, but maybe it's not the most natural thing to see this rook to d d one. It's a very nice mot motive. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, after bishop d five, black doesn't really have that many good moves. I mean, if if he's not taking on on d five, what what to do? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think anyway, just having this bishop pair is very, very nice. You could thinking about taking this pawn, but say black plays like a move like a, a five. I th think it makes sense to just get some luft for your king, like h three or h four. Sure, let's say h h three then, and soon enough, our rook is going going to come active. Uh, so I I think just having this bishop pair is very nice. And okay, you can also think think about taking on e6, and uh, the certainly the seventh rank is a bit weak for black, so you can play rook c7 and try to double. Should also give you very good drawing chances. But if here David gets nervous, let's say, and just makes like, uh, let's say he just play like h h3, 
then I think if if he's not careful, the A pawn could potentially be be strong. Okay, you uh, always have the bishop to d5 maneuver, but if if you don't see it and the pawn slowly gets to a3, I I really think white has has to be careful. Yeah. Um, so I think it's best there to be super precise. It's always best to be super precise, but it could be of uh, importance here. Oh. Yeah, and um, Mario Ratsic uh, asking, do the players lose rating points in this match? Yeah, they do. So uh, I think David is about five rating points up, having one more win uh, than Nils so far in this match. And uh, and we have also one question from uh, Susanna. Uh, about David Howell. He was a chess prodigy and the youngest to become a grandmaster in England. What was the reason he didn't become a chess professional? And uh, I mean, yeah. He was, uh, I would say, a chess professional for many years, but he also went to university. He got a degree, a master's degree. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's tough for some players, you know, just to focus on chess and... Um, uh, obviously, still a very strong player, and uh, just uh, I don't know, one to two years ago, he was still over twenty seven hundred. Um, so, uh, and and now he's been working as a commentator on the Champions Chess Tour. So I guess it's difficult, you know, to combine uh, all these things, and uh, and sometimes you know, life life just happens. So uh, it's it's a good question. I don't have a very good answer, but uh, I think uh, yeah. Some of those uh, reasons and, and, and can explain it, and it's still also. I mean, there's always new players that are coming through, young, younger uh, talents, you know. So it's uh, it's tough, you know, to both establish yourself as a top player and uh, and also having the time to to work on chess as as much as uh, is needed if you want to right. maintain at that level. So. It was very hard work, and even if you're a child prodigy, let's say, and this you you become a grandmaster at early age, it's not a guarantee that you're going to become 2700 plus and and even further. And David uh, achieved this, so it's a great uh, achievement, also, of course. And uh, Mario saying thank you, Askil. Good pronunciation of my last name. Uh, that's nice. Uh, and a master degree in what field? And uh, I think I, I, I asked David about this yesterday. We had dinner with uh, Nils and Ellen, and uh, it's it's quite um, a niche uh, field. I would say it's medieval literature, English medieval, medieval. medieval. So uh, yeah, medieval than middle on so. Ah. so so medieval literature, uh, English uh, medieval literature. So that's uh, quite a niche uh, field, I would say. But yeah, David loves history. And uh, so, uh, and Susanna, I see. Thanks for the answer. Thanks for great comments and analysis as well. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, hope, uh, hope to see you again soon here on Chess24. And I uh, think yeah. that if David finds Bishop to d5 and Rook to d1, it's a uh, close to perfect uh, defensive game. I mean, really uh, nicely played. And uh, so, yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I, I expect him to find this move now after a long, a long time. Yeah. Um, and as you say, you know, it's often it's a process of elimination. Mm. Uh, there aren't that many uh, candidate moves for White in this position. And uh, obviously, David knows if he can trade off the bishops, uh, he will be one step closer to getting the draw. Uh, he needs to win the match. So, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he if he plays bishop. Yeah, five. like it's he's very capable of finding this move, but the position kind of makes him... Uh, demand seeing it but but okay he also plays h h4 so it's no problem with this move if he finds bishop to d5 later yeah so it's kind of like this he, he can still play it yes so i now expect Niels to just go a5 
pushes Bon further, it's it is hope, yeah, that they Apon is the reason why maybe Black has a bit better chances, but yeah. Um, I mean, realistically, that's that's the only way for Black to, to win this game if yeah Apon can um, can go all the way up to A1 and become a new queen. And uh, yeah, Todd has a question for you. Uh, what is uh, Tor Tor uh, studying in school? And uh, I mean, you have a you mentioned you have a gap year now. And yeah. Before that, you went to the chess school, right? Yeah, at the NTG, and uh, coached by Simon Augustin. So, uh, um, yeah. So my interest is the the side chess. I, I really like his story a, a lot, so I could potentially do do something like that. But uh, I'm still not sure what I po potentially could study. So you're you're still so young, so you have uh, plenty of time. And yeah, uh, and now you're focusing on chess, and I hope uh, I hope you will uh, reach your goals uh, in in chess. Thank you so much. Yeah, and um, yeah, Hendra. Petrucci, how much is the prize money? So what's a bit uh, special for this match is they're actually playing for prize money in every game. And uh, the winner of a game gets 1,500 pounds. If it's a draw, both players get 500 pounds. And if it's a loss, you get 200 pounds. So uh, I think both players have made uh, yeah, a decent amount of money. Um, obviously, David has one more win uh, compared to Nils. So uh, I think we will get uh, the exact figures uh, later on, but uh, at least uh, five, six thousand pounds, uh, I believe. Uh, so that's quite good money for for uh, ten days of play. And it seems like this match has been a success. So it's a possibility it might be like uh, hap happening sometime next year, maybe or something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to to see another another match like this, and and uh, maybe we can get a Norwegian player to to play uh, next time. That would be that would be fun. No, but then the match should be in the Norwegian embassy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now we're starting a new trend, uh, having chess matches at uh, yeah. different <laughs> embassies. That would be fun. Uh, that's really but cool. I, mean, I have to say, we do have some strong players, you know, behind Magnus Carlsen in Norway. Yeah. Uh, Adi Antari yeah. is rated, uh, I think, 26, 60 now, around the same rating as these two guys. Mm. So he could be a potential uh, opponent. And uh, we also have, you know, Jun Ludwig Kammer, Johan Sebastian Christensen, uh, even Simon Agdestein is still a strong player. So, uh, yeah. We do have uh, and some up and coming players, including yourself. So it's it's look it looks promising for chess chess in Norway. Yes. Let's see, so okay, it makes sense for Nils to also be thinking here. But I I think ultimately his main plan here is to push the ape on. So. Um. And the, the, they still have 15, 15 moves to play. Um, so yeah. Yes, and if the position does not simplify, like we get some sort of pawn race, then anything can happen on the seconds. Yeah. So. But I think now as um, David does not have the problem of the back rank, he just like now he really wants Bishop to d5, so probably Nils was thinking of some way to like discourage him from playing it, yes, but I guess he saw no way and finally decided to go a5 here. So I expect now uh, Bishop to d5 from David. Uh, I'm sure that there are some other moves as, as well. Maybe you could also think about going rook fc1 with the idea, maybe bishop to c8 or something like this. Mm. Some interesting. I mean, a, a an end game where like it's a passed pawn, but white has four pawns, it's always just a draw. It shouldn't be a problem. So, um, 
But I he's. Mean, uh, I mean, bishop d5 looks looks very natural. Yeah. Yes. So I would he's be. I said this the last move. Okay, now he finally plays it. Yeah. Um, but also now, I guess um, you can even take back with the with the pawn if you want yeah. to. Just uh, don't take back with with the rook. As yeah. That would be really bad. Uh, also, it should maybe be be mentioned that in a position like like this, it's really in um, Black's favor that the rook is like, uh, or um, Black would really want the rook to to be like behind this pawn and and yeah. this active. But of course, you you just take with the pawn, yeah. Yeah. And, and even also if, and even if Black was a pawn up with the, having the rook on d5 and the pawn on a5, I guess White has good uh, drawing chances. Yes. Uh, there are some com complicated cases, but even that one should be quite fine. Uh, yeah, and in this kind of positions, I uh, imagine that the a pawn will, will be traded somehow for the d pawn. Maybe like rook to a5 needs to maybe go rook to d3, and they're going to yeah. shake hands quite soon. So. Yes, you can also play rook d1 first, and then rook a5. But I yeah. think it's, it's yeah, the same idea, basically. Yes. Right off those pawns, and then we have a completely symmetrical uh, position, which uh, should be drawn every day yes. of the week, basically. Moment then, uh, bishops are off. This is the pawn is a lot less dangerous, as, as we have said. So, it should be fun for David. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I just feel I, I I would just play rook d1, start with that, and then play rook a5 because you can never play rook a8 because uh, white plays d6. Mm. Uh, but yeah, okay, rook a5 is also. Yeah, okay, rook a5 makes sense in the sense that he just wants to draw as fast as yeah. possible to be to win this match. Yeah, so <laughs> but I mean, there was nothing wrong with rook to d1 also. I think it leads to uh, and uh, if Nils now plays rook d3, uh, I think we will have a result quite uh, shortly. Yeah, but, but but also like there is no real way for for Nils to keep playing here. The only idea would be to bring the king, but that would be way too risky, and the rook can come to seventh rank. Uh, you yeah. shouldn't really go into adventures like this one. So. I, so suddenly, then white can go for try and win with some uh, attack on the seventh rank. So, yeah, yes. Uh, I think Nils yeah, realizes that this is heading towards a draw now. But anyway, I, I think even if it's a draw, I think Nils can be more or less satisfied with how he played the last game. Yeah. I mean, he I mean, really yeah. tried his best. And so, all press for him to. Trying the last game and David just defended very well. Yeah, and as we said, you know, uh, in the start of this game, um, Nils uh, would have to get uh, a position where he's active and with some some uh, attacking chances, and uh, he definitely achieved that out of the opening. Yeah. But then again, David just found uh, a very nice uh, series of moves which uh, balanced out uh, the position. And uh, after Nils uh, sacrificed uh, the pawn with e5, David calmly uh, gave back the pawn and, uh, and uh, yeah, found a good continuation for him. So, uh, yeah. Credit to both players. Uh, it's been a well-played game. Yeah, sure. So, but I also like the practical solution of David into going into this simplified position where, uh, yeah, he was just precise and held. So, I think Nils, yeah, as he, with a draw, he's losing the match, so it, he's probably just thinking a bit to prolong it, yeah, but... Yeah. So. <clears throat> but those are always tough, you know, the, the last few seconds before you resign for example, in a, in, a, in a classical chess game, you know. Uh, yeah. Your brain okay. is saying, you know, okay, just resign, just resign. But then your your body wants to continue the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very hard to actually resign. 
Yeah. Also, often when you're sitting there, those last seconds, you're often not, or at least sometimes you're not thinking about the actual game. You're more just thinking about, yeah. uh, how am I going to feel now? This is going to be terrible, <laughs> and, yeah. and so on. So it's definitely a very painful moment also. The, okay, it's the difference of losing and making a draw. I mean, it's, you're not as sad in this. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, we've all been there uh, experiencing uh, difficult losses and... Uh, it's just a part of the game. Yeah. And then you have to try and learn something from those uh, lots to uh, yeah. become a better player. Yeah, okay. and here we see Rook to D3, so I expect a draw very soon. Yeah, this is basically a draw for after Rook takes A4 and Rook takes D5, and we have a complete uh, symmetrical uh, position. Mm. Ah, yeah, so. that's a clever move, just to trade off a pair of rooks. Yes, there is no way that is not going to be a draw. If it was two rooks, maybe the, the rook could penetrate on this second rank, could potentially be something, but here uh, it's yeah. really nothing. And, uh, Very clean way uh, to, to secure the draw there from, uh, yeah. from David. And here we also see the importance of having the pawn on h4, that you now can actually take the pawn due to no back rank mate. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, have they agreed a draw or? No. Probably they are going to uh, agree or, or to play something like Rook takes A4, H5, G3. Ah, yeah, they, um, they cannot. Uh... Yeah, something like this, yeah. Yeah. Makes uh, makes sense. <clears throat> Do you know if it is any like move thirty rule to not make draws here or? Uh, yeah, okay. you cannot. Uh, I think the only way to draw before move thirty is uh, if you have a, a threefold repetition. Right. Okay. So, um... But now they have reached move thirty. So yeah. Maybe they have a grid to a draw, I'm not sure. So let's... Uh... <clears throat> <clears throat> Not sure if David is definitely not losing on time, so uh, <laughs> I think there might be just some delay. Uh, yeah, but um, and uh, while we're waiting for the result, uh, I just one last time want to remind everyone of this uh, fundraiser we are doing with uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council. We're up to 9,859. It would be tremendous to break that uh, $10,000 mark. So if you have a chance to, to donate, uh, anything will, uh, will help us achieve that. And it's all going for a great cause to the ones um, affected by the, the war in, in Ukraine, the victims of the war. So there's a QR code here on the broadcast. Um, just uh, open your camera on your smartphone and uh, should be quite straightforward to to go forward with the donation. So that's much appreciated. All right. Are there some uh, delay? I don't know. What's... Yeah, it seems so. I... Oh, okay. okay. They have agreed a draw. The match is over. David has won five and a half to four and a half. Uh, it's been a fantastic match. Um, some fighting chess. And how would you sum up um, the last game we saw today? Yeah, so in this game, uh, Nils were black and tried to play for the win with the black pieces. Uh, we reached his queen to see two Nimso, which has a reputation of being a 
very solid line and very hard for Black to create winning chances. And we reached this main line uh, where Nils in this position uh, did not go bishop to a6 and c5, but rather played a very interesting move c5 and just took back with the pawn. And we reached a very unbalanced middle game uh, where it, Nils definitely succeeded in creating a lot of uh, um, balance. Things were very sharp. And, but after the e5, uh, David played a very practical move, simplifying the po position uh, where Nils were slightly better. Uh, but it seemed like he was never much better. And, and here, after the move rook to b1, maybe Nils' last chance was here to go queen to c7, keeping the queens on, on the board. But after the queens were off the board, uh, David here de defended and, and found a very accurate move, bishop to b7. And once the bishops were off the board, the, the a pawn was not really dangerous. Uh, and the game was soon drawn after those bishops were off the board. Um, so, a good game from Nils trying to create some pressure, but David just uh, defended very well, and he was the deserved winner of, of this match, I would say. So, well played by, by both. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a great, uh, great match. Uh, ten exciting games. Uh, three wins in total. Two for Nils. No, sorry, two for David. Uh, one for Nils. Um, some missed uh, chances here and there, um, but as we've uh, said, also very good, you know, defensive play uh, at times, creating or using the resources uh, they have in the different positions to either uh, defend well or create uh, some counterattacks uh, of some sorts. So, I mean, two great players uh, battling it out uh, to the very end. And uh, yeah, congratulations to David. Uh, Nils obviously is, is a more active player than David, so I think uh, I'm, I'm sure David is very happy uh, with this result. Uh, getting some nice prize money, but also gaining a few rating points, which uh, I mean, chess players say that uh, they don't think too much about rating, but everybody knows <laughs> that uh, they love increasing the rating. So sure. uh, it always feels so good. Even though it's only five points. The higher rated you are, uh, the more you appreciate every rating point. So uh, for sure. So I'm I'm uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure David is is feeling great at the moment, and uh, must be good for him to to uh, to tell the world that you know I can still play uh, chess at a high level, even though I'm I'm not as active as I used to be. And uh, yeah, also credit to Nils. I mean, he uh, he played some very good games showed us some interesting ideas in the different openings and uh, I'm sure he will do do well in the European Championship where you also will be playing uh, Tour Frederik so yeah. uh, looking forward to to see see you both there how, how you will do and uh, also want to remind everyone uh, David and I will be back with the Champions Chess Tour starting uh, March 19th uh, the players will be announced early next week I believe so uh, looking forward to another uh, tournament there. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure uh, commentating here from uh, from London. And and thank you to Frederick for joining not only today, but uh, you also joined the other day. And yeah, to all my other uh, co-commentators, it's been uh, it's been a blast. And uh, hope to see you all uh, see you all soon. So thank you for uh, having me. So, yes. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. So thank you all for watching. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great match. And uh, thank you for all the, the questions as well and comments and, uh, and funny uh, questions. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been great having you on the chat as well. So uh, take care, enjoy the rest of your Sunday, uh, Saturday, and uh, hopefully uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi everyone, welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, 
Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach, and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here. And we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the you know, this is non-chess team. So I see some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand and we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you guys about the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind-the-scenes insights. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> <laughs>